Greetings, esteemed past uh, colleagues and friends. Welcome to the second plenary session of 41st APAMS. I trust that our colleagues in uh, Baltimore had a great nightcap and rest and sleep after that outstanding opening program. And you're, you've had a good breakfast. And to our colleagues and friends in the Philippines, magandang gabi sa ating lahat. Stay with us through the night. It's quite a long journey, but worthwhile. I am happy and proud to host the first part of this plenary session on the special awarding and lecture of the Severino and Paz Co. Award in Science. Before I introduce our winner and our awardee, let me tell you a bit about the Severino and Paz Co. Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering, which should be a special highlight of every APAMS. During the 2000 annual PASA meeting held at the Manila Shangri-La Hotel in the Philippines, Dr. Severino Ko, our founding father of PASA, initiated the Founders Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering. The purpose of the award is to recognize the outstanding scientific and technological accomplishments of PASA members. A committee selects the recipient of the award from nominations submitted by PASA members. The awardee delivers a lecture at the PASA annual meeting and is presented a plaque of recognition and a check of 1,000 US dollars. Dr. Ko and his wife, Paz, donated the seed money for this program. Since the year 2000, we have selected founders lecturers who are honored at each annual meeting. And then shortly after Dr. Ko's death in April 2004, the PASA members unanimously agreed to rename the awards as the Severino and Paz Ko Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering to honor the course long-time dedication and support of PASE. If you visit the box in our PASE website on the Severino and PASE Co. Lectureship Awards, you will see the long list of awardees in science and engineering. Traditionally, the awarding committee is composed of past awardees. And for this year, 2021, the membership, sorry, the awards committee consisted of awardees, Dr. Diana Aga as chair and Dr. Just Santos and Dr. Dani Tagle, last year's co-awardees in engineering and science respectively as members. Okay, with that background, I would like not now to introduce this year's awardee. This year's awardee is a professor of the highest rank at the National Institute of Physics in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is former director of the NIP and he has served in science and technology for almost 27 years. His age index is 42 by Google Scholar and his citations more than 6,700. His ISI publications based on work done at the National Science Institute of Physics are over 70. And publications based on work done 
at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign are over 50. Our co-awardee in science is Dr. Arnel Salvador. Dr. Salvador's work on molecular beam epitaxy, or MBE, and semiconductor device fabrication for optoelectronic and spectroscopic application spans three decades of relentless and innovative pursuit in pushing the boundaries of science. He was part of the team at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that developed reactive MBE using ammonia in the growth of high quality gadolinium N nitrogen films that can rival what was grown via MOVCD. Armed with this experience, Dr. Salvador returned to the Philippines in 1997 and set out to establish a research group working on MBE growth of GAAS, this is gadolinium arsenic, I believe so, and related materials for optoelectronic applications. From the initial equipment grant of the ESSA program, he expanded the research cap capability from film growth to device fabrication and high-speed characterization. This was made possible because, because he was able to involve the academe, government and industry in setting up the facility. He showed that one can effectively increase scientific productivity if one spends the time and effort to mentor students. He has successfully mentored 12 PhD students who in turn have also mentored PhD students. The body of work produced by his group showed that even in the Philippines, one can have cutting edge research work in the very competitive world of semiconductor physics. He has looked at the time response of resonant cavity enhanced photo detectors and vertical cavity surface emitting using time resolved photoluminescence. He has worked on techniques of applying strain to vary the optical properties of the materials, in particular, the terahertz emission of these materials. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome our Severino and Co. Paz Co. Awardee for Science, Dr. Arnel Salvador. The floor is yours, Arnel. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I would like to thank the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering for giving us the opportunity to showcase the recent activities of our group. We have in the past worked hand in hand with the private sector, particularly the semiconductor companies in the Philippines, as well as academic institutions. Nevertheless, I find it important that we reach out to scientists from other disciplines to open up possible new collaborations as well as in sharing ideas. From our experience, the resulting cross-fertilization of ideas has greatly benefited our group and allowed us to venture into new areas. I will describe my impression of the current state of research in semiconductor physics in the Philippines by discussing three devices that our group has recently worked on. I understand that in this venue, we have participants from various fields. I hope that you will find at least one device that will pick your interests and is relevant to your research. After discussing these devices, I will then give a brief history of our group taken from my bias point of view, and then show the current network of scientists based in the Philippines 
working in this area. There may be people in the audience who are thinking of how they can contribute to the development of science and technology in the Philippines, given their own particular situations. I hope my story will impress them on one possible path to take. I will discuss three devices, a gas sensor based on the graphene field effect transistor, a photoconductive antenna, and a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. In presenting these results, I acknowledge the contribution of the senior researchers and students of my group. An image of the gas sensor we fabricated is shown on the left. One is taken by scanning electron microscopy, showing the important lateral dimensions. We have metal contacts, 10 micron in width, and the active area is 40 by 50 microns. Uh, the photoconductive antenna is shown in the middle, and just like the gas sensor, the critical dimension is the 10 micron gap between the metal contacts. Finally, we show an image of the vertical cavity surface emitting laser fabricated by members of the group. This is one taken by an infrared camera. The device requires lateral dimensions of the order of 400 nanometer. In contrast, we note that the human hair on the average is 70 microns thick. So we work on things that are small. While the lateral dimensions are in the micron scale, the film thickness of these devices are easily in the nanometer and Armstrong range. Graphene for one is a monolayer of carbon atoms. The work on the graphene field effect transistors was done in collaboration with Professor Li Wei Lin of UC Berkeley under the Philippine California Research Institution grant. I believe the idea of the Picari grant was initially floated during one of the PAASE conferences. The motivation on working on this material system is twofold. One is to come up with a wearable, low power device that can easily be hooked up to a smartphone or a smartwatch. In addition, we need the fabrication process to be compatible to existing semiconductor manufacturing practice to lower down the price if we are to produce millions of these devices. How will this device operate? The interaction between graphene and the gas to which it will be exposed to will result to either electrons added to the film or depleted from the film. To be able to collect those carriers, we just put two metal contacts at the ends of the film, apply a voltage, and measure the current. The question is, how do we make this device sensitive to small amounts, given that the device will also be exposed to water vapor, which also affects the reading on the current passing through the device? This is where the advantage in using a field effector transistor design comes in. Graphene, being just a monolayer of atoms, is not sturdy. So we place it on top of silicon dioxide, which in turn is placed on top of a conducting silicon substrate. The graphene is the channel in this device and the substrate is the gate. By applying the appropriate gate voltage, we can remove all the carriers in the graphene that possibly came from the ambient environment. In this situation, only contribution, only the contribution from the gas to be sensed will be seen. The drawing on the right shows the condition where there will be little or no mobile carriers. This is the so-called Dirac point. At points where there are many carriers, the signal from the gas will be easily buried as noise due to the large ambient current.
This slide then shows the process of making the device. This process involves a series of steps in photolithography, uh, a technical term which at the end just determines where to put the metal contacts, which regions to protect from the chemical etchants, how large is the device, and so on. In brief, we spin coat the film with photoresist. Then we place on top a quartz a glass with the desired patterns on it, expose this system to ultraviolet, develop the film, and the resulting pattern on the film copies the pattern on the mask. Remember, we are doing this on the micron scale. So on the right shows the picture of devices of the devices seen from the microscope and to the naked eye. For a one centimeter by one centimeter chip, we can make 16 devices. The active area is small, but the contact pads are relatively large since we have to put wires on them and they occupy a lot of space. Now, while doing the fabrication process, we have to check the integrity of the graphene. Will it stick? Will it lift off? Will it have holes? One way of doing this is to use micro Raman spectroscopy. The Raman spectra of graphene is well known. So we scan between the metal contacts and check the quality of the graphene. We also tried WICO interferometry to check the film, but because the film is a few Armstrong thick, we, uh, we cannot see it by this method. Finally, we show the performance of the device compared exposed to different concentration of gas. Initially, we could not get the result we wanted, but by depositing some palladium atoms on the graphene, the performance of the device improved. The device responds wonderfully to water vapor, but our main interest is its response to ammonia, nitrous oxide, and methanol. The pink bar indicates the duration the gas was allowed to flow into the chamber. So the situation is we turn the gas on and off. We see that the device can differentiate one part per million versus three parts per million of ammonia. There are still issues to be resolved like memory effect and recovery of device to multiple exposure, but this study is still ongoing. So that is interesting. When we started this work, we envisioned that we might be using this type of sensors in cars for detecting levels of carbon dioxide when a car goes inside a tunnel. But equally interesting is what are other groups from other disciplines thinking of. Here I show you one work where they are exploring the use of this sensor for COVID-19 detection. The work I mentioned started in 2017 and we had no experience in handling graphene or even GFETs, but we were able to move quickly into this research because over the years we have slowly improved our laboratory from thin film growth to semiconductor device processing and characterization. Our interests were primarily driven based on basic sciences that allowed us to move from one field to another since they had similar concepts. We were fortunate to take advantage of the opportunity that came along. So what I'm showing you now are some of the equipment we had at our disposal before the start of the project. Uh, we had tools for photolithography, metal deposition, the monitoring of the sample during the fabrication process, both the micro Raman and the metal deposition facility were built in-house so we can easily fix and modify them for our needs. The same situation happened for our existing solar cell facility 
which is also built in-house. We were able to reconfigure it for our initial current measurements of the GFETs under exposure to different gases. So we did not lose so much time when, while we were waiting for the appropriate equipment needed in the study to arrive. And this leads us to another interesting device, which we were also studying and using the same ideas and tools that we encountered in the GFET work. This is in the area of terahertz photonics. Here, we show the electromagnetic spectrum and all the relevant appliances and devices that we are familiar with. We have X-rays at the very short wavelengths and radio waves at the other end. In between, we have all of those gadgets. We have uh, devices that emit in the visible. This would be the light emitting diodes. At the infrared, I'm thinking of FEIR spectroscopy, as well as lasers used in fiber optic communication. The terahertz regime is between the infrared and the microwave. The development of the terahertz regime offers the convergence of electronics and photonics technologies. Where can we use terahertz? Uh, it can be used for spectroscopy and identification of some chemicals like explosives. It's non-ionizing, so unlike X-ray, it can be used directly on humans for detection of concealed weapons, uh, security application. It can also be used to inspect integrated circuits. The problem is, unlike the other wavelengths, there are not a lot of efficient emitters and detectors in the terrors. It's still an unexplored area. We now present our recent work on a detector for terahertz radiation. The figure on the right shows you the image of the device as well as the critical dimensions. This work was published in Scientific Reports in 2020, and the lead investigator in this work is Professor Estacio. So as you read the abstract, we would encounter familiar words like metal contacts, and again, field effect transistors. How, is, uh, how do we detect and, and generate terahertz radiation? The figure on the left shows the schematic diagram for our setup. We use a femtosecond laser, a femtosecond fiber laser, the beam, is split into two. One portion of the beam is used to excite the crystal, which results to the emission of the terahertz. The other beam is used to trigger the detector. The one on the right shows the schematic diagram of the layer we used for the detection. This layer is grown by molecular beam at the taxi, and it consists primarily of two parts. Uh, we have a gallium arsenide layer, and on top of that, we grow aluminum gallium arsenide. The resulting uh, situation is that we will have lots of electrons at the interface between these two materials, producing a two-dimensional electron gas. Inter interestingly, this is a typical structure of a device we call modulation dope field effect transistor. Going back to the GFET work, uh, we have done many investigations involving field effect transistors, although of a different type. We were familiar with the physics involved, like what a gate metal does and so forth, so that moving into the GFET research, research was uh, relatively doable. Anyway, we would like to highlight, uh, what we would like to highlight in this work is the new design and process that we used to come up with the photoconductive antenna. Uh, if you look at the performance, we have improved signal to noise ratio of the order of six decibels. And this is comparable to what is available in the market. The figure on the right shows the schematics of how we were able to 
connect the two-dimensional gas formed by the FEP structure by recessing the contacts and putting the metal contacts in this area. Unlike other uh, groups where they use just bulk gallium arsenide for their photoconductive antenna. Our third device, we were working on vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. This is also part of another Picari project, this time with Professor Tony Chang as nine. The intended application for this device would be in data centers, one of the biggest growing segment of the VC cell IT market. But as we started working on this device, other applications came up like facial recognition in cell phones. That's already done. Detecting spacing between moving cars, similar to LiDAR. Even VC cells used to check our eyes. So interest on VC cells have now expanded from transmitting information to detecting and gathering information. What we would like to mention now is how to fabricate VC cells in general. A major advantage of the VC cell design is the ease in fabrication of two dimensional arrays, like the one shown in this slide. Here we have a three by four array of VC cells working. The VC cell layer consists of many layers. One key process is the fabrication of uh, one key process in the in the fabrication is the selective oxidation of an aluminum arsenide layer converting it to aluminum oxide. The layer then changes from conducting to insulating. The process confines the current flowing through the device over a limited volume, making the laser light up at reasonable current levels. The figures on the right show the operations of VC cells taken by an infrared camera <coughs> at the same current levels. We compare the oxidized VC cells to the unoxidized ones. And we see that we get brighter emission when they are oxidized. The cross section of the laser is shown in this SEM picture, where what is important here would be the dark bands. This shows the extent of the oxidation process of the aluminum arsenide layer. The difficulty in the process is knowing when to stop the oxidation process. Too long, the entire device is oxidized and there will be no current flowing. Too short and the laser will not work. And here is where our work shows there is a possible way to monitor the process. We observed that we can use the interferometry to look at the extent of the oxidation. Normally, Interferometry is used to get a three-dimensional height profile of the particular features of the device. For example, here we have a four by four array of circular mesas. The interferometry shows the height of the mesas as well as the height of the metal contacts placed in between. Now, the one on the right shows the image when we oxidize the wafer, we expect minimal changes in the height when we oxidize the layer. But the WICO image shows a clear delineation between the oxidized region and the unoxidized region. We believe this high contrast is made possible because of the change of index of refraction when the aluminum arsenide region is oxidized. And we think this monitoring process can speed up the manufacturing time for VC cells. Having shown the results from our recent works, let me 
give uh, let me now give some timelines or history of our group. This is the interesting part of the talk. In 1997, I was still at uh, University of Illinois, in University, uh, Urbana-Champaign, UIUC, and I was doing work on gallium nitride devices. Um, I found in my baul this uh, old a copy of the old journal. It's a MRS bulletin published in 1997. And by coincidence, in the table of contents, it lists down our work on gallium nitride. And below it is the work done by Professor Suji Nakamura, who happens to be the keynote speaker for this conference, and his talk is scheduled later on. Going back, uh, during the time in 1997, there were already plans to put up world-class research centers in the Philippines. This was the so-called World Bank SF program. So I had an inkling of some of the equipment the program will be buying. Um, it was an impressive set that included a molecular beam epitaxy. And at that time, uh, only the competitive laboratories would have that kind of tool. Two scientists were originally lined up to work on the project, but they went somewhere else. I then got a letter that I need to sign and state that I intend to go back to the Philippines and work on these machines before DOST even starts the bidding process. So there I was with the possibility of setting up my own lab, but it had to be in the Philippines. It was tempting. I took the chance, but it was not a walk in the park. Some of the equipment had essential parts lacking. Some were still in boxes when I arrived, but it was a good situation. This is what I realized and what was impressed to me by my mentor at Illinois. Graduate students are important for a group to function. Here is this famous picture of the original group of students I worked with. They were a remarkable bunch, highly motivated, resourceful, and eager to contribute ideas on how we should proceed. Sometimes I could not keep up with them. Since we only had equipment for film growth, we had to write additional grants so that we can acquire our own metal deposition chamber and the photolithography setup. I also had to include in the budget salary for my students so that they can work full time and focus on the problem at hand. I kept on hammering to our funding institution. Graduate school is not night school. The rate then in 1998 to 2000 was 8,000 to 9,000 a month. I think the rate now is something like 36,000 to 40,000 a month. So you should thank those graduate students for having this idea of graduate students being paid. Eventually, uh, we were able to make lasers and light emitting diodes shown in this figure. But I want to do basic science, like finding how long will an electron tunnel and recombine and then emit light. Fortunately, our success in growing films and those early devices caught the intention of Intel. Together with UP, DOST, and Intel, we were able to bond up funds to set up a facility that will do time resolved photoluminescence. Intel donated the street camera while UP provided for this femtosecond laser. So here is the schematic diagram of the setup. The short ultra short pulses coming from the tsunami laser will hit the sample. You'll have light emitted and the street camera will make a temporal resolution of the light emitted. 
two papers came out from this uh, collaboration. Uh, these were published in Applied Physics Letters. At that time, it had an impact factor of four. That also helped in attracting more students to the lab. Plus, we got added attention from the other semiconductor firms and from foreign institutions looking for an active collaboration. So here is the paper by uh, Professor Estasha, who was a student then. And this is the paper by uh, Dr. Ricoletti, who was also still a student then. Acquiring the femtosecond laser also allowed us to go into terahertz photonics later on. When Intel left, we lost a strong industry partner, but it was also at that time that HGST, a Western Digital Company, was also expanding its operation in the Philippines. Our interaction with HGST was not so much on product development, but on fundamental science. How does one push metrology at the nanoscale? We got another set of equipment from this interaction, plus a DOST uh, research grant. One takeaway we got from this interaction was that the tolerance and resolutions in measurements were much more forgiving in the academe. In doing AFM measurements for our samples in the marcinite quantum dots, we were happy with resolutions only up to 10 nanometer. We have dots from 40 to 120 nanometers. In contrast, HGST needed one nanometer resolution in their manufacturing process. Later on, uh, we were also able to interact with other semiconductor companies as they expanded operations in the Philippines like Sun Power, Maxim, AMS. Again, they were more interested in the work that we were doing on the fundamental side rather than product development. And 15 years later, after setting up the lab, we saw that some of our equipment were not as reliable as before. And there was so much downtime. <coughs> At that time, we were lucky that the Picari program came along. We were able to replace our aging equipment and had some repairs done to the NBE system. The original lithography and metal deposition chamber uh, are now semi-retired after so much use by the students. So we now have a new mask aligner and a new thermal evaporator system. Which now brings back to the question, what is the current status of semiconductor research in the Philippines? We started with one PhD in 1997. Now, our group, we have three senior research faculty members uh, Professor Estacio and Professor Sumintak and myself. Uh, Dr. Estacio and Dr. Sumintak were from the first batch of graduate students that I worked with. Dr. Sadia and Dr. Prieto did their PhD work from the group in the 2014 to 2016 timeframe. Dr. Sadia is currently affiliated with the Material Science Engineering Program of the College of Science. Dr. Preto worked with us for a year or two, but is now a senior researcher at Sheffield University. Uh, incidentally, also doing work on BC cells, this time on a project funded by the British government. So the first batch of students that I had, uh, they have moved on, they have put up their own research uh, facilities. So Dr. Estacio now works on terahertz, ultra-fast photonics, and spintronics. Dr. Mat Sumintak has ventured into material synthesis like nanowires and zinc oxide, and also uses microraman spectroscopy. So our group has grown. I see students in my lab that I don't even know. And most 
uh, after getting the degrees, moved on to the semiconductor firms listed here. Those that have gone abroad, we hope to bring them back sometime in the future. I am also proud of my students that have ventured outside NIP. Dr. Meluna is now based at UP Manila, has her own lab and does uh, Raman spectroscopy for biological samples. Dr. Recoleto is at MSU Marawi doing spectroscopy and thin film growth. Um, I have posted the website of the physics department at MSU Marawi there. And yes, they use Facebook since in Mandanao, there is still no reliable internet or server for them. It just shows you the challenges they are up to, yet Dr. Nicoletto is still tirelessly setting up a lab there, improving the accessibility of doing scientific research to students in Mindanao. So the network has grown, and here we list some of our academic partners in the Philippines. We have research group from DLSU, uh, Dr. Noni Santos has an incredible device and fab and synthesis lab, uh, also working with Dr. Chris Que doing terahertz. We have collaborations with uh, UP Los Baños, and hopefully we would have uh, increased interaction with MSU Jensen now that Dr. Ryan Banal is there. Dr. Ryan Banal got his PhD from Kyoto University, worked in gallium nitride for several years. I first met him in 2009 when I was visiting Osaka. Um, so hopefully <coughs> in setting up base in, in MSU Jensen, he will have a research center there also. Uh, on the right, we list the international collaborations we have so far. This collaboration include tie-ups that involve student exchange, as well as joint publications. So we have University of Fukui, Berkeley, Riken, the Advanced Photonics Research Institute in Korea, Kobe University, Osaka University, Institute of Applied Physics in Vietnam. So in, in summary, we have shown some of the areas that our group is interested on, the network and number of research labs working in semiconductor physics has considerably expanded, and so do the entry points for collaboration. In spite of the challenges, we continue to work to expand that network. What we learned is this. <coughs> Basic research begets applied research and allows flexibility to move from one field to another field. Good science begets good funding. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the funding support from DOST. We have from the Governing Council, the Caster, the Shirt, and whatever institution we can get we can get hold of. UP Systems has been very generous in supporting our lab. Same thing with uh, Ched through the Picari uh, grant, uh, Intel and HEST Western Digital. So. Some acknowledgement, uh, again, listing of the uh, people who have worked on this project. And I've uh, cited some of their research. And next one shows the future PhD uh, graduates of our group. This is the group working on gas sensors. And the next one shows the group working on DC cells and MDE. So thank you very much for listening to the talk. Thank you, Dr. Salvador. Can you please turn on your video? And we'd like to congratulate you, um, person, because I think um, you uh, more than deserve this award. And I'd long wanted to showcase your work uh, with uh, the National Academy of Science and Technology and now also with APASE. So um, as we saw, Arnel works at the NIP in UP Diliman, and he's been able to move forward basic research in semiconductor 
the field. And because of this, he's been able to attract industry. And he's told me that the problem is he cannot supply enough experts that the industry needs. Okay. Am I right, so, uh, er Arnel? Yes. Uh, no. I just got so, a letter from another company. They're asking for 10. Exactly. So anyway, um, I think um, you have uh, shown how you can build a lab, a research group, investing in the right equipment and producing the right results for you to get more funding. So good work begets more funding and more collaborations. So at this point, uh, we'd like to call on one of the uh, alumni of uh, the NIP who has a lot of questions for Arnel, none other than Dan, Danny, Dan uh, Romero. So I should read his questions here. How did you deposit graphene on the FET structure? How do you rule out that the change in resistance is not just the response of uh, the film deposited on top of the graphene, okay? And then did, did you fabricate the VC cells at NIP? Okay, so more questions from uh, Dan after you um, answer the first ones? Yeah, uh, now? for the first one, uh, graphene was actually uh, bought from a supplier. So it's a standard procedure for industry now. So they give this uh, graphene oxide and silicon. So we bought it from there. So the next process is to fabricate that. Uh, how do we know that it's not because of some process afterwards? Um, basically, we, we, we did the WICO scan, we checked for the quality, we uh, had the gas uh, on and off. So we have a controlled environment. So more or less that, that tells us that this is coming from the gas. Uh, the VC cells, uh, that one we've shown is that that one is done by my group at Berkeley. Uh, the idea of the Picari grant was to get some of the equipment into NAP. We've been growing VC cells before, but not at that uh, level of fabrication. But still, they were grown or they were fabricated by my students. Okay. So as a follow-up on the palladium graphene question, it seems to me that since the two are in parallel, the overall resistance is approximately that of palladium if the graphene is semiconducting, that is not biased at the Dirac point. Oh, okay. Uh, I have to look into that. But uh, what we saw is without the palladium, that graphene transistor is very noisy. It, it, it just, uh, the data is not so reliable. All right. So, I'm looking for my questions from uh, the chat box. You might want to type your questions in the Q&A or just raise your hand. Anybody raising a hand to ask a question? I don't see any more raised hands at this point. Can you just ask? There, please. Uh, please identify yourself. Uh, here. Yeah, I, I have a question. This is uh, Leia Tolosa Croucher. I'm a program officer at the National Institutes of Health. And currently, I have a program called SENT, S C E N T, which is uh, stands for scanning for conditions by electronic nose technology. And one of the things that we're looking for are volatile organic compounds or gases that can be tied to um, different kinds of diseases. And I was curious about your gas sensors and your wearables, if you have thought of looking at volatile organic compounds. Uh, yes, that, that is part of the research, uh, things that we have not yet solved. I mean, yes, we can do sensitivity, but selectivity, there is another technique of doing that. How do we distinguish one from the other? Uh, and as an electronic nose, the, the idea was we are going to make an array of those sensors so that we can distinguish one from the other. 
it's still ongoing. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 shut down the lab because my students would not want to, to go into the lab right now. But we are looking at that possibility. The next step is, is true to make an array and make it like an electronic nose. Okay, thank you. So comments from the audience from Joseph Tan. Awesome and exemplary. Congratulations, Arnell. From Dan Romero. Great work at NIP. Awesome. Alvin Colaba, congratulations, Arnell. Wonderful work. Thank you. Uh, it was still not a walk in the park. <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right. So at this point, if there are no more questions, I would now like to call on the chair of the mem of the awards committee, Dr. Diana Aga, and our vice president and president-elect Mario Santo Domingo, and our chair Marge Pena, to uh, give Arnell the award and the citation. I think you're muted. We can't hear you. It's, it's okay. Dr. No. Uh, Dr. Diana Aga will read the citation for Dr. Salvador. Can we ask? Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Diana Aga will read the citation for Dr. Arnel Salvador. Okay, thank you. I couldn't hear you. Um, first of all, congratulations, Arnel. Uh, it was very inspiring talk. I was uh, I was really amazed how much you have accomplished being in the Philippines. And it just tells us that, uh, like you said, with, with great students and mentoring and persistence, you can do anything. That's really impressive. Thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, so it is my pleasure to read the citation for you. As, as um, the chair of the committee, uh, we, we thank also the nominators. Um, uh, we have several uh, nominees and it was very difficult task uh, for us to because there were just impressive uh, resume and and uh, but we deliberated the, the committee looked at every single aspect of uh, everyone's uh, nominations and dossier uh, in the end it was a unanimous decision uh, and it was well deserved that you are being awarded this uh, co-lectureship for science. Um, so thank you. The, uh, so Dr. Salvador is being recognized for his pioneering work on reactive molecular beam epitaxy using ammonia in the growth of high quality gallium nitride films and semiconductor device fabrication for optoelectronic and spectroscopic applications spanning three decades of relentless and innovative pursuit in pushing the boundaries of science. Uh, in addition, this is also to recognize Dr. Salvador's research looking at the time response of resonant cavity enhanced photodetectors and vertical cavity surface emitting using time resolved photoluminescence. He worked on techniques of applying strain to vary the optical properties of the materials, in particular the terahertz emission of these materials. As you have heard from his presentation, Dr. Salvador returned to the Philippines and set out to establish a research group working on molecular beam epitaxy growth of materials for optoelectronic applications. He expanded the research capability of film growth to device fabrication and high speed characterization. This was made possible because he was able to involve the academe, government, and industry in setting up the facility. He showed that one can effectively increase scientific productivity if one spends the time and effort to mentor students, as you have seen. The body of work that was produced by Dr. Arnel Salvador's group showed that even in a resource-limited setting, one can have cutting-edge research in the very competitive world of semiconductor physics. Congratulations and this well-deserved award. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.
Um, on behalf of Paase, we present you this uh, trophy, um, which is uh, actually pictured there. I'm not sure if it's going to show here. Uh, in, uh, in recognition of all your efforts and inspiring work, not just for cutting edge research, but also training the next generation of physicists and scientists. Uh, in addition to this trophy, uh, we also have a $1,000 check from Paase. <laughs> and so as Mario and I were discussing, since it's a tradition to return the check, you will definitely have this trophy to remember and commemorate this forever. Thank you so much and congratulations uh, to, for all your achievements and future achievements. We're very, very proud of you. <laughs> um, and then we'll transition to the next uh, session, like after five minutes. Uh, since, uh, yes. Since we have um, attendees from the Philippines, we will make sure that this will get to the Philippines and you will have this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are muted. Oh. Uh, yes, so I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, joining us in this part of the uh, plenary session this morning. Congratulations again, Arnel. Thank you. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. So we'll have a uh, five minute break. Congrats, Arnel. Well it's a very impressive um, trophy. Can you please describe it better? Is it glass blown? Beautiful. Yeah. I'm not sure that we took a photo with Arnel, you know, with this video on this trophy. Mm.
good. Thank you, Bob, for the sound system. <laughs> okay. So um, when uh, Mario and I were organizing this meeting uh, and we were uh, brainstorming and what on uh, what to put in the program, one of the things that I said was, since this is going to be a special anniversary um, APAMS, we should probably invite some of our co uh, former co Co and past lectureship awardees uh, to give retrospectives and uh, um, future directions of their current <clears throat> field. So today we have four of our past co lecture awardees in science. <clears throat> and the first one is Josefina Comiso, or we. Well, we, we like to call him Joey. He's one of our founders, uh, but he was very young in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Just a new uh, uh, PhD uh, graduate. Uh, he was a co -RD in science in 2002. He's the, a senior emeritus scientist at the cryospheric sciences lab of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, Dr. Comiso, would you like to start your lecture now? Greetings, uh, good evening to those in the Philippines and uh, good morning to here in the US and particularly Maryland. Okay. First, I would like to acknowledge the organizers for inviting me as one of the select few to talk about uh, <clears throat> the core awards, uh, topics, and uh, for allowing me to talk about climate and environmental changes. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know me, I work at the uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, one of the nine centers of uh, NASA, actually the second biggest with the most PhDs presenters wise. <clears throat> and at NASA, we have two scientific goals one looking up at the universe and one looking down at the earth. And I belong to the Earth Sciences Directorate. Uh, when you get to one of the two buildings, one dedicated to space and one dedicated to earth, you can see right away some of the highlights of uh, what the division is doing. You look at forestry, you look at uh, Typhoons, productivity, ozone hole, precipitation. And one of the highlights is the work I've been doing at NASA with the look at the polar regions. Next, please. So, the reason why we became concerned about climate and environmental changes is the fact that. Uh, <coughs> the uh, population of the Earth has been growing exponentially. What you see in the image is actually how the world looked like at night. And concentration of population is uh, uh, in Eastern US, <clears throat> in Europe, India, China, Japan, and a little bit from the Philippines. But what you see at the bottom is actually how the population grew since the year 200. Initially, the rate of increase was just about 0.6 million per year. And from the year 1800 to 2010, it went up to 26.9 million per year. So that's many fold increase in the rate of population. 
in 2019, the yearly rate was actually 75 million per year. So the question is, is this sustainable? Next, please. So statistically, the number of babies born worldwide is about 250. <laughs> number of deaths is 107. So the net population increase is around 75 million per decade. <laughs> so in addition, because of this amount of population, uh, about 37 billion metric tons of CO2 is emitted to the atmosphere. An increase of CO2 of about 2.5 parts per million per year. And in, in the process, uh, we've been losing tropical forests because of the needs of this population of about 12 million hectares a year and 3.8 of which are, are precious uh, rainforests. So in addition, about 54 million metric tons of electronic waste uh, was recorded in 2019 alone. And the earth is being choked by a lot of plastic, <coughs> about 8.3 billion metric tons a year. The question now is the habit habitability of the earth. Is it being compromised by humans? Next, please. So these are the environmental and climate issues. We have global warming due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases pollution in air, land, and ocean, drought that is increasing globally, wild parts that are becoming more expensive, deforestation that affects uh, so erosion, landslides, and also uh, systems of mine, mining and landfill. Uh, we have super typhoons and flooding. Uh, becoming more uh, prevalent. And then we have the gradation in ecology and a loss of biodiversity. <clears throat> so when we talk about climate change, we always start with uh, what is natural climate change. And it's actually determined mainly by the or orbital parameter of the Earth. That means the amount of solar energy that's uh, uh, up, uh, emitted to the earth. There's this uh, eccentricity, orbital eccentricity, periodicity of about 100 to 400,000 years. The axis of the earth is not perpendicular to the plane of orbit, and it has a wobble every 19 to 23,000 years. And the tilt in the axis is also changing from 22 to 24 degrees every 21,000 years. So this was just a theory until they dig ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland and came up with these uh, graphs at the bottom where you can see the periodicity in the temperature, the methane and carbon dioxide, and they're all consistent with each other. So at the last year, that's the peak that year, which is zero, we are at, at the peak of the cycle. And people were already predicting that <clears throat> in the near future, we might come to a, a summer and ice age. And that was reported by Copeland and Kevin. We look, they asserted that the sea ice cover in the 1940s were actually greater than currently. We decided that uh, there's a general cooling globally. So we followed that with a paper that was also published in Science, indicating the variability of the Antarctic sea ice as actually observed from space. And this is more accurate assessment and we came up with the conclusion that 
the computer study is not actually uh, that uh, reliable because what we observe is a uh, new chance in ice cover. Next, please. So there are long-term as well as shorter term historical anomalies. About 15,000 years ago, there was this younger dryas that started the North American ice sheets. 10,000 years uh, BC was a disappearance of that ice sheet. And 8,000 BC, we had the uh, Polishing Optimum. 3,000 BC, we had climate maximum when it was dry and about uh, 1480, we had this little ice age. The Vikings used to co colonize Greenland, but they could not uh, withstand the winter, so they disappeared during that time period. And there are also all these oscillatory events. And some of these uh, changes that you see there is actually associated with solar activities. You know that there are the sunspot cycles, for example, and there was uh, high solar activity about 10,000 years ago, but very low solar activity about 1,400 years ago. Next, please. So, looking at the atmosphere at the start of the Greenland, green, uh, the Industrial Revolution. Plante Arginius was interested in what CO2 could do uh, to, to the global climate. And he came up with the result that a doubling in CO2 caused an increase of about three to four degrees centigrade. It took him two years to come up with that result. He was very confident about it. But then he speculated only that it will take 3,000 years for doubling to occur. Now with observation of Charles Gilling at Madame of Loa, then that doubling could occur within this century. So that result actually by Gilling inspired NASA to come up with a project called Mission to Project Earth. The fact that the Earth might be the only entity in the universe with intelligent life in Congress like that. So they provided a lot of money for NASA. And this is the time when I actually joined NASA. And many because of this graph at the bottom that's provided by the scripts. Uh, from the measurements of Charles Gilly. So if you match the increase in carbon dioxide with the increase in temperature, you can see in the bottom right, a nice matching. If you include greenhouse gases plus natural coffee. Next. Now the warming of the earth is not actually uniform. So what you see here is uh, warming mainly in uh, the Arctic region, but not so much in the in Arctic region. So there's an asymmetry in effect. And in fact, you can see some cooling in Antarctica and some, some uh, west of California. Next, please. So we studied that using satellite data and in the top right, you can see the distribution of trends using satellite data from the time we have uh, data from ABSRR, which is in the 1980s. And you can see where the warming is really uh, most prevalent and mainly in areas where the ice has been receded. But there are also some areas like the Bering Sea and Siberia where this is not cooling. But one thing that uh, we find out from this study, which was published in the 
point is the fact that the warming in the Arctic region is about three times faster than that of uh, global warming. And the reason for that is the feedback effect that's associated with the fact that the sea ice has uh, a reflectivity that's much higher than uh, open water. Next, please. So these are some of the results of my earlier studies. Uh, when I look at the ice at the end of the summer, this actually represent the thicker part of the ice cover in the Arctic. Uh, we found out that the ice cover has been monotonically decreasing. And in fact, if you look at the top right, came out to about uh, 4 million square kilometers in 2020 compared to about 8 million square kilometers in the 1980s. This means the, the decline is uh, about half of what it was. So you can see pictorially on the right of the sea ice cover in the Arctic at the end of the summer has changed over the years. This paper has been, uh, this result has been published in several papers. And the last one published in 2008 was actually very highly cited, uh, cited in the literature. Next one, please. Can you please? Yeah, some of the drop in the sea ice cover is actually accompanied by unusual events. Like this one in 2012, there was a big storm in the Arctic that diverted some of the ice to the south where it's warmer and they, they, they melt very rapidly. So the changes in the ice cover in the Arctic is not just a very simple case of warming in the Arctic, it's also accompanied by many processes. So I was lucky to be selected as uh, one of the coordinating lead author of uh, the IPCC uh, report for 2013. And uh, it came out with a book, Prohibition on the Right. Uh, I was one of the coordinating lead authors. And actually, the other authors are international. Some from the US, Europe, China, and, uh, Russia. So it is an international partnership. Next, please. So, one of the key observations is the fact that we have uh, global warming as indicated in the top. But if you look at the solar component, there's not really that much of a chance. So with contribution from volcanic eruptions and the interne uh, internal uh, variability, like, uh, and so. And the only thing that matches the changes in surface temperature appears to be the anthropogenic component. This is caused by greenhouse gases that appears at the bottom. Looking at the contribution of greenhouse gases, what you see in the top uh, panel are well mixed greenhouse gases. Then there are these short lived greenhouse gases, contribution from aerosol and albedo chains. There's a line in the middle that indicates zero uh, effect. But the net effect is shown at the bottom. In the 1950s, you see uh, it's about half, uh, 500. And that increased to 1750 by 2011. So there's this big chance of 
the effect of greenhouse gases. Next. So through modeling studies, we come up with uh, representative concentration pathways, uh, RCP 2.0. This is uh, uh, keeping CO2 constant at uh, 421 ppm, which is what it is now, and increases to 8.5, this is 936 ppm. This is what we get if we don't do anything. And the result is what's shown on the right with uh, CP 8.5, then you have big increase in surface temperature, whereas with 2.6, you get almost constant value of their woman. And that can also keep the sea ice cover in the Arctic from melting altogether. At the same time, uh, we can solve the problem with ocean acidity in the fact that it flattens out uh, if we keep the CO2 at the 2.6 level. So one of the key effects of warming in the Arctic is the fact that we have Greenland, which is has a very thick snow cover, about three kilometers or more, and it has a sea level equivalence of uh, uh, seven meters. So that can be a big effect. And what you see in yellow are the areas that get melted at least uh, a, a couple of days throughout the year. And the amount of melting has been going up. There was a record high amount of melt in 2002. And almost the whole Greenland got melted in 2012. And this is important because uh, when the surface of the ice sheet gets melted, you have uh, an effect like what you see in the bottom left where you have rivers of uh, liquid water that then percolates to the bottom. And once they get to the bottom, it can make the Greenland ice sheet very unstable. Next, please. So these are the effects of uh, sea level rise. It's actually not uniform, but you can see the location of Manila there, where the sea level rise is actually about nine millimeters per year compared to three times global average. So in Manila, we are a lot more vulnerable than other places. Next, please. We had uh, been unfortunate to come uh, be affected by a big typhoon in 2009. It's called Typhoon Andoy. And much Manila was flooded. You can see a lot of people swimming in the streets. And the extent of flood flooding can actually be viewed from satellites. This one was uh, before on the left and after on the right. And you can see the coverage of flooding from Manila all over Pongasin, as well as uh, in the in Laguna Niguel. The other disaster that came about was Typhoon Haiyan, which we are all familiar with. It was actually the strongest ever recorded by satellite. Uh, the Borshak scale for that Typhoon was 81, compared to 80 that was regarded as the upper limit, and winds went up to about 315 kilometers per hour. About 6,340 people died, and the estimated damage was about $3 billion. We tried to study the reason why the storm was uh, so, so strong. And one way was uh, to look at the source of the storm. We look at the uh, Warm pool in the Pacific, 
motion from a time series of uh, system test temperature there and discovered that before higher, the temperature of the warm core was the highest ever that was observed in satellite data. So we know that the warm SST has a strengthening effect on that. Another effect is drought, what you see in the top left are uh, recent reports about uh, extreme drought when, when they have worked. We have had drought in California from 2011 to 2016. It was uh, a big worry. It even killed 100 to million trees. But we had drought in many other parts of the world. What you see in the top right is uh, the drought in Colorado. And we need to ration 25,000 people because of that drought. And there is this hugging model that indicates that the area of drought has been increasing from about 25% to almost 50%. Next. There's other problem with wildfires. We saw the effect of uh, Indonesian wildfire in 2019 that destroyed 858,000 hectares of forest and two billion dollar in property. But in California, it's even worse. We had uh, much of California covered by fire in 2020. By then, it was considered worse. But in 2021, I think it, it was even worse than that. Next. So there are some mitigation strategies. Uh, most of you are familiar with this. We need conservation. We need alternative energy, like solar, geothermal, wind, nuclear, fusion, uh, uh, biofuel. We need new technologies like electric cars, powerful batteries, cheap solar cells, nuclear fusion. This is uh, very promising at this time. My real storage system, hydrogen fuel. We need more efficient management of energy transport and electric grid, like uh, what uh, Dr. Tarado talked about yesterday. And we need geoengineering, making sure that impacts are first on the solutions. And in this case, some suggested uh, emission of aerosol into the atmosphere to block the effect of the sun, higher fertilization to enrich the ocean so we can take more carbon dioxide. And there is a biochar technique that is proposed by Dr. Tan of Brazil uh, that can uh, boost the sequestration of uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So where are we now in terms of emission? Initially, the US was the main culprit. Culprit is the main emitter, followed by Europe and then China. But over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, China has shut up. And now it's uh, more than double what's emitted by the US. And India is also doing that. So, we need to do conservation. We need to do uh, emission uh, control in the US. But we have been doing that actually, as you see there, that it has flattened out. And actually, in the last four years, we had less emission than the previous uh, four years. But to really be able to control the problem, we have to make sure that uh, China and India uh, is an active participant as well. And that's the problem with COP21 before, because India and China were regarded as uh, developing countries. And so they are exempt for 10 years 
from uh, following the emission standards. So we now have systems like uh, and uh, geoset that monitors emission from different parts of the world. You can we can monitor the emission from China and where they're actually coming from. You see Eastern China being a big emitter with Japan and Korea and the Philippines. Is, is not so much, but it's going as well. In fact, the COVID-19 has provided some guidance on how to mitigate. Global CO2 was reduced by 5% in the first half of 2020. It was the same period in 2019. Pollution in China was reduced by 25%. Aerosol in India was reduced from 0.68 to 0.15, and minimizing anthropogenic activity should be a big part of the mitigation process. Some of what I described here has been documented in some of these books. Uh, I wrote this paper, Polar Oceans from Space in 2010. This, uh, discussions about uh, declining uh, ice cover as well, increasing surface temperature and changing productivity of the ocean. Then we wrote a book on the changing Philippine climate, published in 2014. It was actually selected as standing book of the year by NST the year after. Currently, uh, we have a book that uh, is basically revealed already. Uh, it's called Rediscovering Laguna de Bay, a critical natural resource in crisis. Uh, we've been doing the last one in the last few months uh, as part of my activity as a retiree. <laughs> 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 so, in conclusion, it's unequivocal that uh, global warming is going on, and warming is expected to cause catastrophic events. Strongest signals are, are currently coming from the polar regions, but the most affected are likely those in the tropics. Sea level rise is a concern, especially in the Western Pacific Ocean. Anthropogenic impacts on the environment has been very serious. Pollution all over. Your physical models are good, but are not perfect. And we need to improve them for the future. But solutions are possible, but we need human discipline, sacrifice, and innovative sources of clean energy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Comiso. Uh, we will move on to the next speaker for now, and uh, we can reserve the questions after all uh, our speakers are finished. Our next speaker is Dr. Sevilla Vitero Wadley. Uh, she. Uh, okay, so if Carlito is ready, we can. Michael. Michael. <laughs> Michael. Michael. Yes. Okay. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Purganan. Um, he is uh, the Silver Professor of Biologic uh, of Biology at New York University. He's all, he is also a former journal, journalist. He is affiliated with NYU Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi as well as NYU Institute for the Study of Ancient Worlds. Uh, he was an awardee in 2014. Dr. Verdad. 
you. I'm also surprised there's me because I thought uh, there was somebody else, but I'm ready. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the invitation uh, to give an overview of advances in my field. Um, the idea that I, I was told for the symposium is to give kind of an overview and uh, you know of, of what's been going on in the field that we are um, experts in. Um, I enjoyed uh, Dr. Pisa's lecture and gave me a good update on climate change. Thank you very much. Um, the, I, I, as many of you may or may not know, I'm actually an evolutionary biologist. I'm an evolutionary geneticist. I study evolution. But um, over the past 15 years, I focused my attention really on studying the evolution of crops. Uh, and I'm trained as a plant biologist. And also, so I, uh, you know, I. I I don't really believe in boundaries. Although I'm, I'm an evolutionary biologist, I've trained as a plant biologist. I, you know, as many biologists uh, came into the genomics revolution, I, you know, pivoted and also became a plant genomicist. And since I'm working primarily on rice, um, I've been very heavily involved in uh, crop genomics. So that's what I'd like to give an overview uh, to the community on. Uh, and it's my, own perspective. Um, obviously, others will have different perspectives. And I, I can't do all of crop genomics, so this is kind of very selective. So if you go to the next slide, um, one of the things that, although I really do basic research in evolutionary biology, Development Goals of the United Nations, which was uh, put together in 2016, has the goal, its second uh, SDG is zero hunger by the year 2030. And if you think 2030 is just nine years away, that we're trying to do zero hunger in the world. It's still a big challenge. Um, and we hope to get there, but it is a big challenge. If you go to the next slide. It shows you a little bit some of the uh, challenges in the next slide. Um, we need to increase our crop yields by substantial amounts from where they are today. This is from a few years back and how much crop yields, uh, how much yield for major crops have to increase to meet the global population of the world projected by 2050, it's not 2030 global. So you can see, for example, rice, which as we know, as Filipinos, we know it very well, we need to essentially increase it by nearly 50%, by 42% from where it was a few years ago. Um, the challenge can be put uh, in stark contrast in the sense that um, worldwide yields for crops have been increasing at 1% per year, which is pretty substantial, right? 1% a year of increase in yields uh, have been achieved um, uh, primarily because of science and technology, because of the way we are developing new varieties in the scientific community and developing new ways of growing our crops. That's the good news. The bad news is that in order to meet the, the global world population by 2050, we need to increase by 2% a year. So we need to almost double the yield increases. Um, and again, that will only be achieved really by, um, by applying science and technology to the problem. So how do we do that? So we go to the next slide. Well, over the last, I'd say uh, 20 years now, 25 years, uh, Biologists have amassed a massive set of techniques and tools to advance our understanding of the biology of crops and also to help improve them. And one in particular is uh, genomic technologies, uh, at the core of which is genomic sequencing technologies. You may all be aware of the sequencing of the Human Genome Project as a major landmark in, uh, in the advance of biology in the last uh, two decades. Um, but, and many of you are of course familiar that the, the, with the advance in human genomics, actually what happened was that genomics across the board was also advanced in different ways. So it was not just the sequencing of the human genome that was a major achievement, but what it did was it brought technologies that can then be used in other species, in other animal species, in other plant species, including crops. Um, and my laboratory was fortunate to be um, I wouldn't say we were an early adopter of genome sequencing technology. We were actually quite a late adopter, um, but it's something that we've used in our lab quite a bit. If you go to the next slide. 
Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to show you some highlights of genome sequencing technology and how it's advanced crop genetics. The first plant genome that was sequenced was Arabidopsis in 2000. It was a nature cover, the one shown in the left. Um, the, the, this is a plant that's used by plant biologists as a model plant system. Uh, it's got a relatively small genome, 120 megabases, 120 million bases. By contrast, for example, the human genome is 3 billion bases. So this was a relatively small genome. Uh, just as a uh, in contrast, the maize genome is about 3 billion bases as well, somewhere in that, that range. So maize or corn is, this, is similar in size, in the same ballpark as humans. Uh, Arabidopsis is a very small genome, and it was the first kind of test case for plant genomics. But very soon after, rice was sequenced. It's the first crop that was sequenced. It was actually sequenced by uh, initially by two companies, by using very early technology, and then later by an international research effort. The very first release of the sequence, which was um, by uh, Syngenta, um, a biotech company, was in 2002. Uh, and it was uh, actually the, the quality of the genome sequence was not very good, but it was at least the first one for a crop genome. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and since then, um, about 100 crop species genomes have been sequenced. So this gives you a timeline from 2000 to the present of different crop genomes. This is not, of course, the list, but these are just highlights. Uh, this is based on a review that we just wrote this year uh, on uh, crop genomics, but you can think like tomatoes, apples, papayas, soybean, um, you know, pea, pearl millet, wheat is still, it, it, it was only sequenced in 2018, and you can see why it's 17 billion base pairs. Um, it's like five times the size of the human genome. Um, but we managed to sequence that, not we, but the community. Go to the next slide, please. And, and one of the ways that this has been helped is the advances in uh, genome sequencing technology. Um, has been occurring at a very, very rapid pace. So you all familiar with Moore's law, which is the amount of time for the doubling of the density of circuits in semiconductors or semiconductor circuits um, that has been used as a way to indicate the speed of technological advance. I think in Moore's law, I forgot now how often you double the, the does anybody remember? It's a few, it's, it's less than a year, right? Seven years. Seven years? No, it's, it's, it's got to be faster than seven years to double the density in circuits. And I think it's fast. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really fast. But uh, in, in genome sequencing, I mean, one way you can look at it, you can look at a different way, but you get the cost of sequencing the genome. So the Human Genome Project, for example, when, it, uh, when the human genome was being sequenced, uh, to sequence the human genome costs about $100 million um, to sequence. And you can see how that cost has been dropping similar to Moore's law until about 2007. And then you'd have this massive drop in the sequencing of a single human genome. So today, the, sing, uh, the, the a genome sequence to be sequenced completely is about $1,000. It's $100 million to $1,000 in a 20-year period. It is, so, um, it is so routine now to sequence an entire human genome that if you, for example, have a cancer, um, they will sequence the cancer genome, check what mutations you have. They can sequence your own genome to tailor um, therapies to use a human genome uh, in, in your human genome. But what that gives you is the reduction of cost. And again, while this was driven a lot by the need in uh, medicine and the human genome, it also helps all biology, including crop biology, because that also helps us advance crop genomics. If you go to the next slide. Um, and, and, and there's many technologies here. I'm not going to go to the technologies, the early technologies um, the early modern technologies or the next generation sequencing technologies was an ability to sequence short reads of between 50 to 150 base pairs of genomes in a, a massive scale. This was usually based on, there were many technologies that did it. The one that really dominated the field was the one based on Illumina, the Illumina company's technology. Uh, but in the last 10 years, what has also revolutionized things is that uh, the ability to see, sequence long pieces of the genome instead of small pieces have, have really um, advanced tremendously. Uh, and there are two major technologies uh, that are being used by uh, workers, by us in the field right now for long reads. One is smart sequencing technology by PacBio, the other is nanopore technology by Oxford nanopore technologies. Um, and it used to be that long read technology was very specialized and very expensive. Now the price is just gone down tremendously um, in, in, in massive scale to the point where you can get long read nanopore sequences 
in undergraduate laboratories when you're teaching undergrads. Oops. Go to the next slide. I mean, we've, we've exploited this technology in my lab. These are three papers that we just published in the last two years using long read sequencing technology, where we've taken a, a species and done their complete genome and assembled a very good genome uh, based on long read, a combination of short read and long read technology. Uh, just two years ago, or I don't even remember when we published this, maybe a year ago, we um, assembled uh, the sequence of basmati rice because we didn't have one and we needed one lab. So we just decided to, to sequence basmati. Um, several, you know, two years ago, we had a paper on the date palm genome, which is about twice the size of the rice genome. Uh, we did that with the pack bio sequence. The, the basmati rice was done with nanopore sequence. The, they promised them with back by sequence. We were also involved in a project to sequence pineapple, the Bracteatus pineapple genome uh, that was, just came out two years ago as well. So these are only the last two years. You know, we're now just churning out whole genome sequences um, because we can, and it's relatively uh, cheap right now to do it. Next slide, please. Um, but the other thing we do in the lab quite, and a lot of what is done also in crop genomics is to look at genetic diversity by sequencing not only one individual in a crop uh, species, but multiple individuals, and to look at the suite of mutations that are present in different individuals uh, within a crop species, uh, and actually use a fairly extensive, intensive computational modeling. Uh, to try to understand the pattern of these mutations that we see in different crop genomes. And I'll show you later on, some of that tells us something about uh, mapping genes that are important for function. Uh, some of it might just be to try to understand how the species evolves. Uh, and we use the reason I have this equation, this is actually the uh, Kimura diffusion equation for the, for the change in frequency of a mutation in a population over time. Um, we use heavy computational modeling in our work. That's the other advance in genomic technologies is the ability to do computation uh, very intensively for these very large data sets. And these are very large data sets because for example, about two years ago, I remember in one day we deposited 1.7 trillion base pairs in database in one day for one of our projects. Uh, and that just show you the amount of data that we are able to do. I, I found out just, uh, three months ago that um, actually at, at New York University uh, in our high performance computing, my lab was the third highest user of uh, computational time. The, the first two were climate change, climate change groups at NYU. We were the third. Um, so we have something in common with Dr. Camisa. Um, next slide. Um, so as I said, by, by, by sequencing different individuals within a species, um, we can actually map um, genes important for various traits that might be important, not only for biologists, but for crop, uh, for breeders. So this was African rice, a project we had several years ago. Um, uh, African rice is a different species from the rice we eat in Asia. It's a, it's a, it's a related but separate rice species. And here we were looking at salt tolerance uh, in West Africa. We were able to map genes. Uh, this was in Nature Genetics uh, five years ago. We were able to map regions of the genome with genes for salt tolerance. So you can imagine that would be an important uh, 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 trait for uh, breeders. In fact, uh, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, who was in the uh, REC4 meeting last night and is a member, uh, was a co-author in this paper. Uh, with us. He was a close collaborator in our salt tolerance projects. Next slide. Um, we've used also, as I said, the, the, this genome sequencing data from different individuals to try, try to reconstruct the history of the spread of uh, rice or other crops from where they originated in terms of rice, the Yangtze Valley, and it spread north to Japan and Korea, south to the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, and uh, westward as well. And this was a, publish, a paper we published last year where we used genome sequencing data from a thousand, more than 1,200 individual rice um, varieties to try to figure out its expansion. Why would we do that? Well, for once, we're interested in the history of the crops. Um, but the interesting thing about that is by reconstructing the history. And um, we also uh, work with paleoclimatologists to reconstruct uh, paleoclimate history. We're trying to see how climate is forcing the evolution and the dispersal of crops in different ranges, and also how they become locally adapted to local environments as they're moving from where they originated from to different environments with different climates. 
Um, and again, genomic technology is very important in doing this. Next slide, please. Um, and, and it's not just sequencing technology, just to look at the uh, sequences. We can also use this uh, in many different ways to look at different functional aspects of plant genomes uh, and to glean more information about the biology. So this is kind of a different scale where I've been talking a lot about genome sequences, but you can look at what's called the epigenome, some of these transient marks in the genome that may affect the expression of genes. You can look at three-dimensional genome architecture. I don't have results on that right now, but that's something I laboratory is interested in how the chromosomes fold in the nucleus. We look at the expression of genes, both single cells and not in my lab, but in the whole plant as well. We look at how the plant looks like phenotype um, using uh, lots of digital um, technology. Uh, and we look at it in the field. Uh, that's something we do. Uh, as you know, I'm at York University in the middle of Manhattan. You don't really grow rice in the middle of Manhattan. The <laughs> you grow, grow it at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. We have collaborations there that allow us to grow, um, do our field experiments uh, then in the Philippines. Um, so the next slide, please. So these are just some of the functional genomic information. So again, it's not just DNA sequences of the genome. We can look at the RNA sequence, which gives us expression of genes, both total RNA and small RNA. We can look at how uh, different parts of the genome are more open to the binding of proteins or chromatin like accessibility. Um, we can look at DNA methylation patterns. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, we can look at how histones, which are these proteins that are bound to the DNA in its natural state, are modified by acetylation or methylation characteristics. We can look at active polymerase. We can, there's a lot of different uh, ways these technologies are being used to look at different aspects of functional information in the genome. And that really has also exploded in the last 20 years. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and so this is a project we did in the rice genome uh, that was published last year where you can take the rice genome and then you can put all of these different parts where what parts of the chromatin are open, is it being expressed, what parts of the genome are methylated, um, what, what histones are, are modified. And so you can take all of that information together to tell you the state of different parts of the genome, which is functional, which are not, which are active and which are not. Go to the next slide. And, and we can, in fact, integrate that with the DNA sequence information from the different individuals. And I won't go into that now, but we can actually assign what we call a fitness consequence score. You can, you can see that in this, in this diagram in the middle, there's what we call the fit con score. And what that is, it's, it's actually a way using evolutionary data and those functional data I showed so that we can look at across the genome and say, if there's a mutation in this region, this is, this has an effect or it won't have an effect. If the FITCON score is zero, if you mutate that region, there's no effect on function. If you mutate that region, if the FITCON is one, it will always have an effect on, on, on function. And you can see how important that would be to a breeder, right? To be able to tell them this part of the genome, if you get mutations here, this will have an effect on function. This part of the genome, maybe it won't have such a great effect. Uh, and we were able to develop the first what we call the fitness consequence map in the rice genome. And again, this was published uh, last year in Nature Plants. Go to the next slide, please. We've also, you can also take uh, the data on the, um, inter, uh, the, the expression of genes in different environments and see how they interact with each other and how they're related to each other. This was a paper we published five years ago where we look at transcription factors in the rice genome. We're able to get about 4,500 interaction in 4,000 genes. Uh, under things like uh, drought stress, heat, both heat and drought in the field and circadian clock. So you can see now how you can integrate environmental data to see how different genes are being expressed and how they interact with each other. Um, and we were able to do that for rice. Uh, and we're still doing that now. We actually have data now for salt tolerance, for salinity. We're incorporating it right now in our uh, project. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about rice, and in fact, that, that, that's it. We have other projects in rice. As, as, as was mentioned, I also have a lab in Abu Dhabi. There we work. You can't grow rice in the desert. They're trying to, but I think that's really stupid. Um, they have date palms, which are great for the desert. We actually have projects on date palm uh, as well uh, there um, that, that are really exciting uh, as well. I'll go to the next slide, please. 
So uh, a lot of what I told you, if you want to read more about it, I just gave you a little flavor of it. We published this review, Nature Genetics, a few months ago, uh, advancing crop genetics from lab in the field, me and colleague of mine, Scott Jackson, who is now with Bayer Crop Science, uh, said to do Nature Genetics, ask us if we wanted to write this. And we said, sure. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's open access. Uh, so you can check out um, our thoughts on how to get advanced crop genomics. Next slide, please. Um, and, and, you know, to just, just kind of summarize, you know, we need um, genomic technologies is one of a number of tools we can use to apply to help understand the biology of crop species and hopefully help to address um, the second SDG goal of the UN, which is to ensure food security in the world and to fill this gap in yield that we need to fill in order to feed the world's population, obviously including the Philippines as well. Um, next slide. Please. Um, and I'd like to end up by thanking my present and immediately past lab who have been involved in the project. Um, there are several people um, that have been involved. Um, the ones that are underlying Chris Zaidan uh, and Jill Robredo are actually the Filipinos in the lab. I wanted to <laughs> highlight them because I want to make sure that they're highlighted. Uh, we're funded by the NSF uh, Ziga Family Foundation primarily. Um, and as we're going to members of the lab, I'd like to end because I think it's it's appropriate now. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this just shows you somebody who visited our lab the other year. <laughs> and you can see Jill Robredo here to the right. She's an undergraduate research assistant in my lab. She started out in NYU as uh, biological sciences and engineering, but then she switched to math and economics. Um, but despite switching to math and economics, she's still working in the lab as an undergraduate research assistant. She's still working. Uh, 10 hours a week in the lab. <laughs> now, that's how she gets her allowance. She doesn't get anything from her mom. She gets it from working. And Chris Ivan is here. And um, as I told um, our our vice president, she might be the vice president, but in the lab, she's just Jill's mother. Um, <laughs> visiting, but she visits, she tries to visit every year. Um, so she's also familiar with genomics work. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Crush. <laughs> Crushing. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Sevilla Duterte Wadley. She was the recipient of the Co Lectureship Award in 2017. She is from the National Institutes of Mental Health, and her research interest is in uh, the genetics of mood disorders. She was president in 1999, and I just have to say that her house is our favorite party venue. <laughs> Still downloading the slides. I, I I just got the email, so I'm still the oh, uploading the slide. I can't even hear it. No, I don't have anything to oh, plug okay. it on, so okay. I, I, we have to wait. Sure. Hello, I I was actually thinking of just doing this virtually, <laughs> but I couldn't plug in. <laughs> I had a lot of problems with that. Uh, at about 7.30 this morning, I'm taking a taxi and, uh, you know, going to Cambria Hotel. So it's nice to see you guys. Um, I, I just want to say this. Um, the other day, I read um, in the news that President Biden declared the October, the month of October as Filipino American month. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. This is, this is very, very good. And uh, also, thank you, um, Joey, as always, uh, the climatologist in the PASE. And also thank you, uh, Dr. Puruganan. Um, you know, they, they took care of the environment and climate and also food. Now let's take care of the human being. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
my research uh, involves um, the use of induced pluripotent stem cells um, to try to study uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. But today I'm just gonna talk about generalities. I'm not even gonna present my own um, work. <clears throat> um, yes, I have to have this disclaimer uh, because of ethics. Next slide. Okay, the summary of my talk. First, I will uh, present how you reprogram adult somatic cells. This is good because ethics is not involved. You're using adult somatic cells, not fetal cells to IPS. Um, the power of IPS is that it's pluripotent as the name implies. Uh, you can differentiate it into any disease relevant cells like neural cell, um, astrocyte, uh, um, cardiomyocytes, kidney cells, whatever you, you want to uh, study. And using IPS uh, derived cells, you can do gene editing. You can also do drug and toxicology screening. And a lot of uh, clinical trials are now being done for cell therapy. Of course, there's still problems because this is a new technology. Um, okay. Um, what are the issues in biology and medicine? We know that. Um, they say you have to ask the right questions if you want to do research. What is the biological basis of the disease that you're interested in? For example, uh, diabetes, asthma, um, schizophrenia, or Alzheimer's disease. And it's not really well known what the function of these diseases are, the, all the functions, especially the, the genes that are involved in complex disease. What is the environment or the environmental component? Um, can we uh, find um, some factors that we can use for prevention and also for prediction? Um, it's still you know, a, a big problem because there are no efficacious therapeutic um, regimens, for example, for mental disorders. You know, you can like muffle down some of the symptoms, but um, uh, you know, some of them, some of the, it's, uh, it's sad that some of the people are not, um, you know, cured. Uh, there's really no cure. But also what we want is to find some treatment that are tailored to specific genetic background. Okay, when we study biology, when you do the research in biology, uh, we usually use appropriate models. And a lot of times, animal models have been used to create disease dysfunction, for example, in um, animals like zebrafish, mouse, rat, or even in monkeys. These are non-human models. Now we have a human model which is uh, IPS. Um, and, but as we say, models, the definition, it doesn't really recapitulate the hallmarks, the full hallmarks of the disease. But um, next slide, please. So what is IPS? It's, they are pluripotent embryonic-like cells that you can generate from somatic cells um, derived from mature tissues like skin or blood. And this was developed by Yamanaka and Takahashi in 2006 and 2007. They started with a mouse in 2007. They did it in um, humans and converted fibroblast cells to pluripotent stem cells using four transcription factors of four PLO4, SAX2, and MIC. Uh, in short, it's called OKSM. 
And this is uh, Shinya Emanaka. He, uh, for that um, discovery and development of a very powerful technique, he got the Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine in 2012. Yes, it is a game changer because now we have the unprecedented ability to generate various types of cells that you're interested in that are specific to the patient or the donor. So um, by, you know, um, it, it uh, um, goes to say that uh, IPS carries the genome of that particular individual. And as I said earlier, you can differentiate the cells into um, whatever you want, but cells that are inaccessible in, uh, you know, in the living human being, like brain and heart, you cannot take, can I take some living brain cells from you, you know, but here you have that ability can be transformed into 3D organoids. Um, 3D organoids are getting so big now. Um, and you can, uh, it provides a bank or a resource of cellular reagents that you can freeze and then recover. So you have a constant supply of this, whatever cells you want to um, generate. So here is a uh, diagram of how um, reprogramming is done. It, on the left side, you have fibroblast cells and with the uh, four transcription factors, sometimes it's carried by a virus like the Sendai virus, which doesn't integrate into the genome. And after about a month, um, you get this uh, colonies from the fibroblast cells, you get the colony of cells. These are now the um, IPS or pluripotent stem cells. Um, you can also use blood, which is easier. Uh, you isolate the uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs and do the same thing. So uh, I alluded earlier to um, the use of IPS. This is modeling. So if you are doing this is modeling, you can do omics assays, exome, transcriptome, proteome, imaging, um, apaxic. And I don't have to talk about it because uh, Dr. Paruganan has already uh, um, you know, described these different assays. And as he said, um, next generation sequencing has the price of next generation sequencing has gotten so, uh, so low that uh, you know we don't even do it in the lab anymore. You just send it to the uh, to a company, and after a couple of months, it's back. All you have is the raw data, and uh, you analyze it. And as I said, you can edit the um, uh, whatever the IPS. Um, uh, if you want to knock out a certain gene, you can use CRISPR or other gene editing methods. And tissue modeling, as I said, 3D organoids, screening for therapeutics, toxicology screening, and cell replacement. It used to be that they were thinking you can use autologous um, transplantation, but autologous transplantation is so expensive. They tried it in Japan uh, on AMD, um, AIDS-related um, macular degeneration, and it cost a million just to treat one patient. So uh, Yamanaka has uh, devised this method where they um, uh, went to, um, you know, different uh, Red Cross and blood bags and uh, look for individuals or DNA that had so homozygous HLA carriers. That way you can generate IPS from there. And when those cells are given to other people, it's not, they are not rejected. Uh, or the immune rejection is low. And precision medicine, because you can take cells directly from the patient and study them. And if, you, um, if that particular patient belongs to a certain group, 
or with a, a certain genetic background, then after screening, maybe they uh, respond to certain medications. Um, okay, this is modeling. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna talk about two different types of uh, diseases here because you know there's only uh, limited time. Um, I'm interested in this uh, diseases that are involved in brain function. For example, for the developmental example of that is autism, neurodegenerative, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, neuropsychiatric, schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression. And I'll also um, allude to coronary artery disease. Okay, just to remind you of the human brain, we have a hundred billion neurons and a hundred trillion uh, connections. That's how, and a lot of the energy that we use in our body is used by our brain. So um, next slide. So uh, IPS, when they're differentiated to neural cells, this is what you see. So you have the colonies, the IPS colonies, and during the process, you form these neural rosettes, which are um, early um, neural cells. And then uh, after a while, with changing the media and other factors, you get neural progenitor cells. And then you change the media in the presence of growth factors like um, brain derived uh, neural brain BDNF and GDNF, and you get these neurons after a few weeks. Um, so the first time I saw this in our plate, I said, oh my goodness, see how complex the brain is. And this is only 2D. So uh, it, it's really amazing that uh, you can see this in the dish. Next. Um, and organoids, as I said, they're doing their several labs, uh, many labs now are generating brain organoids because here, you know, you have the structure. Although it's not uh, a complete structure of the brain, but at least it recapitulates some of the structures of the brain, like the hippocampus, hypothalamus, uh, cortex, etc. So. One of the most interesting things that um, Sergio Pasca, who um, was the, one of the authors here, is at Stanford. In one of the meetings, uh, he showed this uh, you know, connectivity of the ventral and the dorsal part of the brain. He um, um, uh, differentiated IPS into the dorsal part of the brain and the ventral and put them together and they just automatically uh, came together. So this is it's really amazing. I said, oh my goodness, we're getting into science fiction. <laughs> Next. And uh, this was the very first um, publication by Lancaster and Ken Oglick in 2013 on brain organoids and uh, she is really one of the first that well and Kenoblik uh, there she was Kenoblik is in Austria and now Lancaster is in I think either Cambridge or Oxford but um, here are the different parts of the brain that they um, uh, that were formed and one of them is the choroid plexus uh, the reason why I'm pointing to choroid plexus is because in two different uh, publications uh, last year, I think, from Lancaster's group and from another group in University of Pennsylvania, they found that the COVID, the SARS-2 mm -hmm. virus, uh, affects uh, or binds to the choroid plexus rather than the neurons. The choroid plexus is the one that uh, uh, you know, gets the uh, CSF formed. So it's, that's why, you know, you can think some of these people are um, 
suffering from brain fog. This is probably one of the reasons, but you know, I don't know. More research has to be done. Um, so I'm just uh, showing you an example here of a neuron. This is 2D. It was derived from control versus an ill individual. Here's the healthy donor, and the other one had this uh, FTLD is a degenerative disease. And um, what you can see is that on the right, the um, uh, tau protein is, uh, there's a lot of aggregates, you can see the orange uh, color there. And um, this is one of the, this is the reason why these people um, suffer from um, neural degeneration. So let's move on to from the uh, brain. Let's go down to the heart, which is of course uh, one of the most important organs. Um, next, and so uh, with, from IPS you can um, generate um, cardiomyocytes in the uh, on two D, um, and you can uh, see it here. And the next slide, um, if you can. Uh, is there a way to, because there's a, yeah, you can see that on, on the plate, the cardiomyocytes are uh, beating. So, um, okay, next. And as I alluded to, if you know the gene that you're interested in, you can always, um, do CRISPR is a lot easier now to uh, edit genes and uh, um, Dr. Jennifer Dogna and Charpenter got the Nobel Prize for that uh, last year. And uh, here, here is a uh, diagram of you have healthy donors versus deceased patients and what you can do. The isogenic approach is actually one of the best approaches because what you do is you have the cells from uh, one individual and you also take the cells from that individual and do the uh, editing. So it has a, the two cells of the same genetic background except for the edited portion of the... Uh, so then the comparison between the two is uh, a lot more, uh, a lot better. Um, but, you know, as in human genetics, you always need more samples. But this is the, uh, the next. And um, this is a cartoon of how you do high throughput screening with um, um, IPSC derived cells, donor, Plus and minus genetic risk, and um, just a cartoon. And um, for drug screening, there are multiple drugs now that have been, um, and this was, I think this is 2021, uh, that have been um, um, generated uh, using IPS platform for drug screening. And um, you cannot read it, I can hardly read it either. So, but just to show you that um, there's some success um, in drug screening, next. Um, and the last thing that I'm um, going to point here, point to here is personalized medicine. This is what, you know, this is like the, um, uh, uh, aim of a lot of people, you know, if we can have a, a group of people, if they have a certain disease and we can tailor the drug for those, to those people. It's, it's like, you know, we had have, we have that already, for example, in uh, hypertension. Some people respond to certain anti-hypertensive medication, some don't, but um, so I think personalized medicine uh, will be um, uh, or um, IPS research 
would be a boon to personalized medicine. Next. And here's a list of clinical trials using IPS and derivatives. This was a um, from a review by Yamanaka in 2020. So there, there's a lot of uh, activities going on now. Um, and this is like the future. There's still, you know, there's still a lot of kinks that need to be resolved, you know. Um, so what is the take home message um, for the future, for the present, IPS-based modeling? It is a state-of-the-art uh, approach for studying disease relevant cells derived directly from patients or donors. And um, it is helping us gain new insights into the pathogenic process. It's a good platform for screening for new drugs and cell therapy. There are multiple clinical trials that are occurring now. And as I mentioned, personalized medicine. Um, that's about it. Um, I'd like to say Dr. Puruganan, one of our previous postdocs, is now uh, enrolled in medical school at NYU. Mm -hmm. He was involved in IPS research on Smith McGinnis syndrome. So um, we were targeting NYU because of the free tuition. It's really great. <laughs> So anyway, thank you. So much, Sibyl. So we go from um, the climate to food to the brain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so that's why we are so excited. What will Carlito talk about today? <laughs> um, is Carlito ready? Okay, so Carlito Labrilla is our 2011 Co-NPAS Lectureship Awardee in Science. He is the a distinguished professor of chemistry at UC uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, and just recently, uh, of course, he has a lot of awards aside from the lectureship award. But just last month, he was given the Frank H. Field and uh, Joe L. Franklin Award for Outstanding Achievement in Ma Mass Spectrometry by the American Chemical Society. Um, Carlito, you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, is it, are you seeing in the right mode? Is it in presentation mode for you? No. no. Is that better? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, um, I'm sorry I, I couldn't make it there this time. Uh, between teaching and our COVID restrictions, I, I'm, I'm, at least I'm glad I'm, I could share this with you, but I was always happy to uh, meet all my colleagues at PASE. Um, so I was asked to talk about what happens to uh, to the research, and I think this is a great idea uh, because sometimes you hear you see great results and and then you always wonder what what happened to it, where did it end up, and then I'm, I'm going to share with you today sort of uh, where the research went, but also uh, you know I'm uh, I was a young immigrant here with my family. And, and I think it sort of shows you an immigrant journey in the sense that you're, you're trying to uh, do new things outside of your comfort zone and always trying to, uh, to advance uh, yourself and, and, and the community. Um, and so my research in the last few years has, has really focused on biology, which is ironic because I've never studied biology. Uh, but what I, uh, so, so I'm a physical chemist. I'm a physical scientist. And so biology to me was always sort of interesting, but felt like there, were, there was a lot of dogma. There was a lot of things that people believed in. And then when you ask them, where does it come from? Oftentimes, uh, or when you look for it in literature, you actually can't find where it came from. Uh, and so we decided to, to look at things like diet and health and nutrition from a very analytical point of view. And that is looking at the compounds that make it up. 
we've seen a great talk by Michael on um, uh, on on the uh, the genome, uh, but uh, we should also remember the genome is a map. It doesn't and it doesn't tell you where you'll end up or where it'll end up. Uh, so the actual biological compounds that are produced by the genes, uh, by the proteins, and so on, is really uh, or the phenotype itself uh, is really where a lot of diseases happen. And so we decided that we would study those products and look at uh, where to uh, apply that to something so basic as our health and our nutrition. Uh, and so we've seen uh, incredible uh, advances in sequencing. Uh, we've seen it in, in proteomics. However, uh, a biopolymer that's actually quite common uh, has had never been advanced uh, before we started this. Uh, and so a lot of the methods came out from Hakamuri uh, in the 60s for, to look at uh, carbohydrates and glycosylation in general. And so carbohydrates, and, and for that reason, I think carbohydrates today, you say, okay, well, I'm trying to avoid carbs because you know I don't want to get uh, diseases. But carbs is such a nebulous, broad area that it becomes meaningless because people don't really, it's not really described very well. Uh, and so my group for the past 30 years have really been developing rapid throughput methods uh, to understand these structures. And the reason why they're difficult is because if you look at the, the, the genome, it's a sequence. There's only one way these things are put together. And so if you have the sequence, you have the structure or, or you have the identity. The structure, of course, is in the, the three-dimensional structure that make it up. And it's the same way in the protein. If you have uh, if you have the sequence, you have the identity. In carbohydrates, sequence is only the beginning because what happens is that when you have sequence, uh, you have things like branching. You have things like, you, you, you could add two compounds together and they could, they could be produced in uh, 10 different ways. And so in that regard, it's, it's, far, it's infinitely much more difficult to uh, analyze uh, glycans and glycosylations. So for that reason, uh, it's really, uh, we decided this was the way we were gonna, we were gonna proceed. Uh, so I'm actually sort of a, uh, a techie. I, I love new instruments. I love uh, machines. I, I love cars, motorcycles, uh, things like that. And so I actually got into science because I like to build machines. And so when we first came into, into um, when I first started my career in Davis, I was building mass spectrometers. Uh, and in fact, that's how I got my position here because I was gonna build one of the highest resolution, uh, the fastest uh, an analyzing uh, methods that, that was possible. And we did that. And, and, and I got my tenure building Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance. But over time, I realized it's the biological questions that are actually quite important because we have these great machines and we have to solve problems with them. Um, and that was actually not so much driven, well, it was driven by my desire, but actually it was driven by NIH funding. And so we kept telling them we were gonna build these big machines, uh, but then at some point they, uh, you know, they, people ask, well, okay, what biological problem are you gonna solve? So, so we picked on the one that was actually the easiest to say and that one that everybody knows about, but was the hardest to do. Uh, but we've replaced a lot of the instruments that we built with actually commercial ones, because when we started, these instruments were not available. And today, uh, they're much more robust than anything. And you could never build these anymore. And so uh, we quickly, well, over the years, we replaced all our instrumentation into uh, commercial instruments that are much more rugged, uh, that, that can, um, that with better performance. Uh, in the old days, our instruments would, would work uh, maybe six months and then six months it wouldn't work. So while it wasn't working, you were writing papers and fixing it. Uh, and then you, were, you, you would gather your data, but these instruments are on 24 seven and they're always analyzing. Uh, so this is the problem we tried to solve. And the problem is what, how do these structures, um, well, what do these structures do, right? And, and, uh, and this is just one type of these types of sugars. This is one that's commonly 
uh, sort of studied. And what it is, is it's a, it's a, uh, it's a process whereby different monosaccharides are put together. Uh, so first you have a lipid, and then you start adding like uh, an N-acetylglucosamine, another N-acetylglucosamine, mannose, and so on. And so this happens in almost every cell uh, from, from the, the simplest to humans. Uh, more recently, because of, uh, you know that, um, of course, the, the COVID around us, but the COVID virus is a highly glycosylated protein, or at least it's a highly glycosylated molecule uh, um, organism. So from the very simplest to us humans, uh, this process occurs. Uh, but, the, but it's a strange process because you add on these different carbohydrate groups, these monosaccharides, uh, until you get to this part here. So this is, these are all mannose and this is glucose. And then what happens is that you start trimming this back. Once, uh, because what this does is it helps the protein fold. This shepherds protein folding, but once the protein is folded, the, the, it gets sh uh, shuttled somewhere else. And then you trim this back. And then what happens is that you put something new, but it's, so it's like a car assembly line. However, in your assembly line, if you had, if these were cars, it's like you can, you can, pick, you can pick up your car anywhere along the assembly line. So in other words, you can have a, a car that has no wheels, for example, or a car that has no windshield or a car that has no seats. And, and that's what glycosylation is. There is no such thing as a complete structure. And so, uh, and it's also very much part of the protein itself. People think that the protein is only the polypeptide, but the protein is actually the glycan and the protein, it's, uh, and the polypeptide. And so when you say a protein, you really mean the whole thing. And so, uh, and, and so that, that needs to be really clearly understood. And so wh why do we study this? Well, is it, how important is it to life? Well, this is one sugar, it's called a fucose. And this, uh, in every living tissue, uh, this gets added on. So what happens is that you have this uh, glycan, and then you have this gene, and then this ad gets added on. And so this will happen in cell lines. And you can knock this out and you have a totally viable cell. Right, so the cell line will actually live, uh, but but in mutations where this occurs in animals, in mice, if you knock this out, then the mice is not it's, it's lethal. In humans, uh, there are phenotypes where this is diminished or is knocked out. Uh, however, uh, those uh, people don't live long, and if they do, they're severely handicapped uh, in many ways, and they don't live uh, very long. So this is just the addition of this one sugar really makes that, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a viable human or not, right? And so that's just one type of the kinds of uh, glycans we've studied over the years. However, we've looked at human milk oligosaccharides, we've looked at, uh, we've looked at O-glycans, N-glycans, we've looked at glycolipids, and more recently we've looked at polysaccharides. So we were talking about rice earlier, uh, and it turns out, uh, even though the rice genome may be um, the same between different strains or, or very similar, the products that they produce in terms of the carbohydrate could actually be quite different. Uh, and so that was one of the, some of the surprising things that we've discovered uh, was that even the same species will produce different types of carbohydrates. And so that's why uh, this is sort of important. Uh, and so we developed methods that could take the glycoprotein and we could trim off the glycans, right? So that's one way that we would analyze these things. So we would take, for example, the tissue uh, or any tissue, we've removed all the glycans, and then we would look for changes in glycosylation that correlates to diseases. The other way that we looked at this is we would take a glycoprotein, and then we would use trypsin or whatever uh, protease that, uh, that was necessary, and we would produce glycopeptides, and then we would use our, uh, liquid chromatograph mass spec to figure out the, the glycopeptide. And so we would get the glycan with the protein uh, information retained. Uh, with regard to the, to the first part, uh, you would get a, a chromatogram that looks like this. Each of these represents one structure. They're numbered. So this is taking serum, releasing the glycans from the glycoproteins. And what you find is that this is the most abundant structure, for example, and you can, you can go through these things. 
and, and actually determine all the different structures. Uh, and we were actually the first group to do this, to figure out what were all the different glycans and their different glycoforms that are associated with serum. And we've used this, for example, to uh, develop biomarkers for disease. And so one of the things that we've discovered, and, and not just us, but uh, um, many others, was that in cancer, uh, the changes that happen at the genome level uh, manifest themselves into changes in glycosylation. And so, so we thought, well, why not just take a whole serum of someone who has the disease and someone who doesn't and compare them? And we were able then to figure out specific glycans that were associated with lung cancer, for example, uh, ovarian cancer, gastric cancer. Uh, it, we were able to de determine that when a cell differentiates from a stem cell to a, a, a differentiated cell, uh, then uh, the glycosylation changes dramatically, uh, prostate cancer. And we even studied some uh, the Iceman. Uh, this was a, a frozen mummy that they found in the Alps and we were able, uh, it was 5,000 years old, exposed to the atmosphere. And we found that you could still analyze the glycans on, 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 on their tissue. Uh, so there's been, uh, about 70 years where people have said glycans are important in cancer, but there have really been very little effort in using glycans as biomarkers until we started in about 2001, we decided we were gonna look at ovarian cancer and started to look at the changes in glycosylation. And ever since then, many, many papers are now starting to um, look at glycans as biomarkers for, for, for cancer. And so this led us, and, and so that it's sort of that immigrant spirit again, where you try something new and we thought, well, if we can create, if we can look at cancer and we can look at the disease, why not use glycan as biomarker? And why not make it available to people? Why not create a product that will actually differentiate cancer? And so uh, I tried this about 10, 15 years ago, and I failed. I just, it just um, at the time it was just too early. Uh, people couldn't believe it. The genome revolution was just starting. And so that sort of took all the focus out and no one really thought that uh, glycans as biomarkers would really be all that interesting. Well, a few years later, we tried again, uh, this time with a dynamic, um, with a, uh, with a dynamic uh, CEO, uh, Aldo Corascuso. Uh, you've probably seen videos of him in CNN Philippines uh, being interviewed quite a bit. And what we did was we said, well, let's try this again. We're gonna do glyco, the technology got a lot better. We kept working on it, even though the company failed the first time, we kept working at it and we decided to, uh, uh, well, we, we used new technology. The technology was uh, ever evolving. Our methods were getting better. And this time we started a company called Interven uh, it, so it this uh, hit the news recently because uh, they just uh, in a Series B financing they just obtained 200 million, 50 million the first uh, Series A, another 200 million in, in Series B for cancer diagnosis, and uh, they've already had the first sort of FDA uh, sort of allowed uh, test in a CLIA lab uh, for ovarian cancer using precisely the glycoproteomics. And uh, we're looking at, the company's looking at all kinds of different cancers now. And, and I think in the near future, you'll see these tests being uh, brought out to the public and people and will have um, tests for breast cancer, prostate, uh, ovarian, and all these different other cancers using uh, glycan biomarkers for glycoproteomics. Uh, the other work that we got involved with is, um, characterizing human milk. And so this was sort of a, a, an interesting uh, area for us because we were good at uh, analyzing carbohydrates. And it turned out human, uh, humans, mothers, produced um, non-digestible fiber for their infants. And it was non-digestible because their infants had no enzymes to break it down. And so this was sort of one of these 80-year-old mystery because uh, they were asking, why would mothers dissolve themselves to produce something that had it appeared no nutritional value to the infant? And so one of the first thing that we did was we analyzed what were the oligosaccharides 
And we uh, created this chromatogram and we created all the different structures that are associated with mother's milk. And so this is now a high throughput method. It's, it's automated. We can, we've studied thousands of mothers and we found that there are essentially two phenotypes. Uh, there are mothers who produce these structures uh, and there are mothers who produce these structures. But what we also did was since, we, we, since we're chemists, we, I, we pulled these things out, we purified them, uh, and then we started testing them. What were their function? Uh, and one of the things that we did with a collaborator was that we gave it to bacteria, different bacteria. And E. coli uh, didn't touch, nothing happened. We analyzed it after in the supernatant afterwards and nothing happened. Salmonella, same thing, nothing happened. However, when we gave it to one particular bacteria and this bacteria was found in healthy breastfed infants, it ate it, there was nothing left. When we, when we looked at the supernatant, all these structures disappeared. And then we realized this was what it was meant for. It was meant for a bacteria that was found in healthy infants so that the mother can have the, this bacteria babysit her infant. And so that was a, that was a breakthrough, uh, but we also since then have, have uh, studied all around the world. And remember I said there were two uh, phenotypes. One is the secretor uh, phenotype and the other one is a non-secretor. We studied based on the milk, we could uh, phenotype them, which also genotype them. And so no, uh, this was no genomic data. It was all just the, the product of the, of the human milk oligosaccharides. We were able to, for example, figure out that the non-secretors were about 20% of the population. And that was well known because uh, people did the genotyping on, on, on mothers and said, hey, they're non-secretors. Uh, however, what we found was that in parts of the world, like in the Gambia, the non-secretors were about 40%, which is huge. South Africa was the same way. In India, it was really high. And then we found regions where there are no non-secretors based on their milk. So indigenous tribes in Peru, in Bolivia, uh, even Argentina and Brazil had very low, low levels of non-secretors. And you ask yourself, why did that happen? And, and, and uh, Michael, I, I wish you would look into this. Uh, why, when, when, what happened to the non-secretors in South America? We think it's disease like cholera wiped them out because if, you, uh, call, if you're a non-secretor, you're much more sensitive to things like cholera. On the other hand, if you're a non-secretor, you're better off at fighting things like HIV or um, uh, perhaps even COVID. Uh, so if you're a non-secretor, you're good at fire, fighting off viral diseases, but if you're a secretor, you're good at fighting off bacterial diseases. Uh, and so we think that local pathogens pretty much wiped out the non-secretors in South America. So, so from human milk, uh, and, and the, uh, the person who actually discovered this is a talented uh, student from the Philippines, uh, Milady Nino Nuevo, who's now a senior scientist at uh, Genentech. But she was the first one to actually separate out the human milk oligosaccharides. Uh, and then we started feeding them to bacteria. And then our collaborators found that in the US and many developed countries, this bacteria had actually diminished. And in fact, uh, more and more, we're finding that this bacteria is, is absent in a lot of um, infants. Uh, and so what we did was we said, well, let's make it available. And so we created a product that was a probiotic for babies who were being breastfed. So if mothers were breastfeeding their infants, they would give the, the infants this probiotic and it would establish. And, and now we know that this probiotic actually works very well. Uh, for example, uh, kids don't have, it eliminates colic uh, and uh, some really um, big, well, colic is a big issue, uh, but we found, well, uh, let me do this for a second. Uh, so you could buy this at Kaiser, for example, which is a human, uh, an HMO here in, in, <clears throat> in the US. Uh, a lot of health systems are starting to use this. And so this is a, the, a, another company then that we started. Uh, this is called Evolve Biosystems. Uh, it's about five years old. Uh, they have about um, maybe 50 employees, uh, 100 employees now, I think. Uh, they've raised over $150 million. They recently raised uh, $67 million. 
to expand their market. Uh, it's one of the first probiotic with, with deep clinical data. They've done a lot of clinical trials. They recently received uh, $30 million from, a, uh, from the Helmsley Trust. Uh, it turns out that people now believe that this will end type 1 diabetes. So they're doing clinical trial in, in Northern Europe to test that. Uh, we also know that in, uh, necro in NICU units where they use this bacteria, we, they essentially uh, are eliminating necrotizing enterocolitis. So this is a, a, a very common disease with preterm infants. And if you give them the right bacteria, it turns out that they may not get that anymore. <clears throat> so the last, the last a bit of work that we've been working on recently is uh, the polysaccharides, right? So human milk oligosaccharide uh, took us, uh, you know, uh, took us, it didn't take us, well, uh, it took us a year to figure out what the structures were, even though the mystery of them was about 70 or 80 years. Polysaccharides, on the other hand, are much more complicated. And of course, most of what we eat are, are polysaccharides. So even though you're saying, well, I'm eating vegetable, there's no carbs in that. Well, sorry, but that's all carbs. <laughs> uh, if you're eating uh, greens and, and all kinds of healthy things, it's all carbs. It's just a different structure of carbs. And the reason, and the problem is people say, when they say carbs, they mean starch. Uh, and, and you know, so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't confuse that anymore. Uh, so there's no sequencing method for polysaccharides because it's very difficult. Uh, there's no general enzyme that converts polysaccharides to oligosaccharides. And you need oligosaccharides to be able to study them, to analyze them. Uh, because this, uh, And again, there's no analog to trypsin. Um, so what we did is we came up with a, our own enzyme. It's a chemical enzyme. Uh, it turns out if you take iron and hydrogen peroxide, which is a hundred year old chemistry, and if you just get the right conditions, you throw that at a polysaccharides, in fact, you get oligosaccharides. So you, from, some, from some linear change, you get something like this. So it's very much like trypsin, except it works for polysaccharide. And it's also, there's also some kind of selectivity associated with it. But wow, look at this. These are oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides are bioactive. What if you use that as a food? So uh, uh, examples of like polysaccharides that are good for you are, are beta-glucan. Those are the, the polysaccharides in oats. But what if you could create oligosaccharides that are much easier to digest for your bacteria? Uh, and so we created this, this cool method and we're, we're actually analyzing food. We have a, a large grant from the USDA, from the National Institute of Health, from the Rockefeller Foundation. And we're essentially creating what we call our glycopedia, the glycan encyclopedia of food. And we're trying to figure out what is it that we're eating? What is, if you eat a celery, if you eat uh, uh, a cabbage, um, what is the polysaccharide that you're eating? And then we're gonna, we are, we're already relating that to um, the microbes that are being uh, enriched by the kinds of things that you're eating. And, and, and that work is being done uh, with Jeff Gordon at Washington University, who's one of the most uh, eminent uh, microbiologists uh, in, in, in food. Uh, and so, well, that was another opportunity. What if we created bioactive carbohydrates for food? So that instead of you having to eat cabbage, uh, what if we gave you the cabbage polysaccharide or the, uh, the uh, cabbage oligosaccharide so that, yeah, you, don't, you may not like cabbage, but you're still going to get the benefit and your microbiota is going to love you because it's getting the, the cabbage uh, um, carbohydrate. And so this was a company that we, we started, uh, BCD, stands for Better Carbohydrate Design, so BCD Bioscience. Uh, this was, uh, so this is a very early company. It only has... Um, maybe less than 10 employees. They raised $5 million in, in VC funding. Uh, this is the typical trajectory of companies. Uh, the, the next round will probably be about uh, 15 million or so, 20 million. Um, I can't say because I don't make those decisions, but, um, but uh, the typical trajectory of companies is that you raise a small amount, five to 10 million initially. The second round you go, maybe 20 million, and then after that, you know, in the 100 uh, million or, or so, or you do an, uh, 
an, what's called an IPO. But anyway, uh, so I'm really excited about this company because there's a lot of interest in microbiome. Everybody's raising and a lot of the work in the ge uh, genomic uh, world is being done on microbes, uh, but they have, but no one thinks about how you feed your microbes. Everyone is all trying to characterize it, but no one is thinking, or very few people are thinking about what do you feed your microbes? And I think w this is gonna do that. We're gonna figure out what each microbes eat and we're just like we did the human milk oligosaccharides, and we'll be able to provide what's called a symbiotic, the combination of both the bacteria and the microbes so that um, your, your microbial health can be also looked at. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's the, um, the work. Uh, this is a, a picture pre-COVID. Uh, so this is like two or three years old. Um, um, some of you may recognize some people here. We have some people here from the Philippines, but also it's, it's um, uh, undergraduates and, and graduate students uh, that, that are in my group. These are the, the, the people that have fund me, funded me over the years. Well, actually, these are my current funding. Uh, and um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all and um, I'm happy with the opportunity to, to present a follow-up of since the since my award. Thank you. Wala ka sa Zoom. Ba't kita makita? Ba't kita malocate yung pangalan mo? We're not hearing the... Um... We're, not he we're not hearing the... You're not hearing? No, we're not Hello? hearing. Okay, now we are. That's it. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, we are going to change the program a little bit. Um, I'm pretty sure there are so many people who have questions for our uh, four speakers. So we're going to have um, a short Q&A uh, from now until 11, in, uh, at which point we will have Dr. Nakamura, our distinguished keynote lecturer. And then after Dr. Nakamura, we will have um, plenary talk by Rosalie. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Rosalie, for putting you between everybody else and lunch. But um, then we will have Rosalie and then lunch. So questions, please. Any questions in the chat? OK. Come, come over, please. Oh, yeah. So a quick question for Joey. Joey, thank you for your talks. But you pointed out that uh, the Philippines has a high likelihood of uh, sea level rise uh, because of the changing climate. Can you explain what the fiscal reasons are as to why the Philippines has that uh, high likelihood of sea level rise relatively? <laughs> and the data I presented were actually from satellite data. They were from uh, uh, the JSON system and that looks at the surface of the ocean. And uh, as you see, the distribution of sea level rise is not even all over uh, around the world. Yeah. And it so happened that in the region near Manila, that's where the, the sea level rise seems to be uh, increasing a lot more than others. 
And in fact, if San Francisco is actually the opposite. So the reason for uh, changes in, in uh, the sea level rises because of uh, different warming in different areas and uh, the circulation pattern of the ocean. So <clears throat> it's, it's something that has been documented for some time, and I think it's persistent. And in fact, they, they've tried to verify this with models, and uh, they're, they're, it seems to be reliable. So, is it a generalization that countries that are located near the equator tend to have this higher uh, uh, probability of sea level rise compared to, say, countries that are farther away from the equator? Yes. Okay. In fact, in Stockholm, it's, it's not uh, going up that much. Thank but, you. Uh, oh, I should mention that uh, climate experts uh, is one of the big areas in the NSM this time. Yes. So, uh, Biden's uh, program on uh, climate so is a very good uh, mm -hmm. so, Lots of money mm -hmm. being put in it by the current director. Yeah, I know. Um, so the talk is coming up soon in Glasgow. I was wondering, like, um, what maybe what your team is doing or what NASA is doing to contribute to the conference departments, like in terms of research or how, what's what's their contribution to the talk to the upcoming um, conference departments in Glasgow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, in terms of uh, contribution from NASA, we have been launching uh, new instruments, like uh, there's this OCO system that then monitors uh, carbon dioxide all over the world, and it's called XCO2 because it integrates uh, CO2 emitted from certain areas. And you can see for sure where emissions are coming from. So what I said earlier is that uh, there's no way we can solve the problem if we don't involve places like China and India, who are likely the, the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases in the future. Um, I do have a follow-up question for you, Joey. I'm not sure if my voice is loud enough or I should use one of the microphones. So you showed the UNEP data, which I thought was very interesting. And I decided to take a look at the data um, myself because you did show the absolute uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, China being on the rise, mm -hmm. but concurrent is the, per, is the per capita graph. And when you standardize data in that way, they found US and Russia to be highest um, carbon emissions in per capita. And so I'm curious, you know, if we focus on absolute emissions or per capita emissions, how would that affect um, the approach to reducing, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and the like? Well, the, the policies have been uh, on a government by government basis. So the fact that China has uh, a lot more people than the U.S., for example, uh, comes over my pictures. And, and also India Questions makes, makes this country really a big uh, contributor to pollution. So uh, per capita, we might still be emitting more, but overall, then you have to consider the fact that the policies you know, that, that in coming up with is uh, government by government, and in fact, Right now, they're, ex they're still exempting China and, and India from responsibilities to curb up their emission. You know, they were considered developing countries, and they were given exemption of something like 10 years. You know, COP20. Right. And the UNEP, the, each of the governments, the countries, they made like their own goals, if I remember correctly. So the so the so the proposed actions by China are different from the U.S., which are different from Argentina and other countries. I assume. I think most countries have goals to reduce their emission, 
And in fact, uh, China is keen and uh, producing a lot of solar cells. So, uh, solar energy is very popular in China. And they, also, electric cars are also very popular in China now. They're building uh, uh, factories for batteries. And in fact, that might be a problem for us because if we go into uh, electric cars, we'll be very dependent on China for uh, batteries for these electric cars. Thank you, Joy. You can just you, talk. If you, if you, you speak shout. very loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have so many questions, but I think I'll address my question to the bit. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> there's been some recent ethical problems with using cells that are not authorized, like the work of plants from the cancer research. And as well as maybe for some of you who are not aware of uh, the development of, of Jackson and Jackson for the using work stuff from the Netherlands for the Would your technique be able to serve from that, that so we don't have the ethical problems anymore? That is a very good question, but uh, I cannot speak with authority and I don't know the answer to it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it seems like it's a good way. <clears throat> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good way. I think if you go from the, um, I don't know, it's, it's really very hard to, um, they have to develop the technique. If they maybe you know there's yeah, a know. Um, there's a possibility you know things that we have now um, that were not even predicted fifty years ago so you know who knows I don't know the answer another question yeah so um, you were discussing the possibility yeah, of yeah, yes. you don't have a loud choice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zivil, for your uh, excellent discussion. I was just wondering, I was just wondering about the IPSC being able to be used for Alzheimer's disease, because if you can, and you did demonstrate a few of those cell proteins in one of your slides, but is there a possibility of using this kind of technology for reversing Alzheimer's? Thank you for the question. Actually, that's one of the aims of people who are um, involved in um, research in neurodegenerative diseases, both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And there are some clinical trials that are going on. So I don't know how um, you know, successful they will be. So, because what happens in Alzheimer's and, for example, Parkinson's disease is that um, neurons degenerate in, um, I think, basal ganglia and part of the brain. So if you, uh, for example, inject cells like neuroprogenitor cells in, into the area of the brain, probably it can um, regenerate the neurons. But I, I don't know. I think they're doing um, animal studies also. But this is not my field, but this is um, um, my, I've read sort of things that are happening in the neurodegenerative diseases. So this is, um, yeah, I think um, IPS will play a really big role in um, not curing, but uh, treating Alzheimer's and um, Parkinson's at the early stage, because when you get to the late stage, it's almost impossible to reverse the um, um, uh, the dysfunction. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Sibyl. Uh, I do have an announcement. Um, we have in the program uh, the Meet the APAMS 2021 Fellows, an introduction. Um, since we don't have enough time today, that has been rescheduled to tonight. Um, I, I don't know what time yet. We will announce later. So that's tonight, um, US time, tomorrow morning, uh, Philippine time. Any other? Um, yeah, yes, more money. Uh, this question is for if Michael or maybe even Carlita. Every time I go to a restaurant, <laughs> there's always the same gluten free. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I know that is supposedly for people with celiac disease. Right. What is the future for bread that has? <laughs> You don't have to be gluten free. <laughs> Carlita might be well. Carlita can probably address that better, but there are there are now a lot of gluten free. So gluten is a protein that's uh, specific to wheat. Um, and it's just specific to that to, to that group of uh, cereal crops, um, and there are ways to process it so to remove the gluten. Uh, unfortunately, it, I mean, it, it, it doesn't affect taste. It affects nutrition, obviously. Um, it also affects the elasticity. So there's certain products, certain things that are harder to make. To make. Uh, the, the beauty is rice is gluten-free. It's, it's not wheat and sour corn. Um, so, and, 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 and the connection with celiac disease and other types of um, issues are now uh, relatively well known. But I think it's, they, they remove it by processing. I'm not sure if you can remove it genetically. I actually don't know if you can remove it genetically. It might have an effect because it's a seed protein. Um, it might have an effect on viability of seed. Um, I don't know if Carlita knows more about this. Uh, there is a startup <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, uh, uh, I think, I believe Takeda is working on this and that they, they have a, a, an enzyme that cleaves gluten right mm. at the point that is uh, sort of immunogenic. Uh, and then that enzyme seems to be very, uh, they've created, a, engineered an enzyme that's very specific to gluten. And so in the future, you would probably spread this with your food and uh, the enzyme would, would work on breaking up gluten in your stomach while you're eating it. It's like lactase filling. Yeah, yeah, like, like Beano or lactate. So are there any other questions for me or Carlito? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, I can repeat your question. So Carlito, I sent you here again. So I was really very interested in your talk because number one, you said that we don't need to, you know, that myth about vegetables, because I hate vegetables. Now I am looking forward, I am looking forward to eating vegetables in a pill. Uh, is there a possibility for that to happen to, to, to say junk food where you can reprocess the carbs so that they are all now uh, zero calories? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's coming. I think also, oh, I think there is a, uh, like, there's also a lot of waste. So for example, if you're making juice, there's a lot of good carbohydrates there that are currently being thrown away. Uh, and so, and, and, and in general, I think, you know, um, when, you, when, you, when you plant rice, uh, you eat the grain, but 99% of the rice plant itself gets discarded. But what if you could reclaim the carbohydrates that's in the rest of the rice? And so you can make the whole thing edible. And so we, we mapped out, for example, the carbohydrate in corn. Uh, and we found that even in the, the leaves and in the tassels, there are good carbohydrates that you'd find in vegetables. As well. <laughs> so as a, as, a, as, a, as a future of sustainability, I think, uh, you'll be able to get similar carbohydrates that you didn't like in the broccoli, but now is, is, that, is in your food. And it probably came from pomegranate pum pumice that they used after squishing out the pomegranate juice. 
uh, so, so, so I think, uh, yeah, once we understand which carbohydrates activate your microbes and your microbiome, uh, then for sure you, you'll be able to get that in, in, in many different ways. Thank you. We have two questions uh, from, uh, should we start with um, Giselle first? Please turn on your microphone. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I have this question for um, Seville. Seville, hi. Can you hear me, Seville? Yes. All right. So I just wanted to know uh, if you are also working on um, spinal um, cord cells and degenerative diseases. You're able to um, uh, coax um, into um, you know forming um, neurons, organoids, in the brain. But what about the spinal cord? And uh, there are degenerative diseases there that you know are quite well understood, including multiple uh, sclerosis or uh, things like transverse myelitis, where you have the myelin sheath that's, um, you know, inflamed and uh, destroyed. So um, I think there are many people who would benefit with this kind of research in the spinal cord. And I have other questions for, Ma, for um, Michael and uh, Carlito, but before, uh, Seville answers, I might as well say that perhaps Carlito, now with the, you know, the kind of big money that you're raising with your companies, maybe you could uh, devise uh, or come up with a program, uh, you know, for PASE that uh, would benefit some of our uh, best uh, researchers. So maybe some kind of a seed fund from Carlito. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but uh, my serious question to uh, Seville first. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. And actually, your question is very timely because when I was preparing this talk, I came across a very recent paper from Japan. Um, what they were talking about is toward spinal cord um, cell therapy using IPS. So I can, what I can do is I can send you that particular uh, paper. Um, they're getting, they're getting into it now. So um, there's, there's hope. Thank you. You're welcome. I think Arnell has a question, so he might as well uh, ask first. Arnell, um, we have exactly two minutes. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a quick one. Question to, to, Dr. Uh, to Dr. Carlito, uh, when we isolate the carbohydrates and see the effects, uh, wouldn't that be also different if that carbohydrate is with other chemicals? Because uh, there might be some other complex reaction that, that is being bypassed when, when we just have the carbohydrates. For example, the milk, I, I would imagine one carbohydrate would actually control the bacteria, but there is another a chemical in the milk in the milk that does something else, such that if we just give the carbohydrates, we might be missing out something. Uh, yeah, that's you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, there could be uh, uh, synergistic effects, and and I know NIH is trying to create this sort of whole body programs, where or uh, or even in milk, where it's a it's a complex it's a complicated mixture, uh, but. Um, but to do that, you have to begin to understand what are the components and what possibly could they do. And then once you do that, then yeah, I, I think uh, uh, future uh, areas of research uh, and future innovation is going to be, uh, if I give this different carbohydrate, uh, what kind of fats should accompany it? What kind of lipids should work with it and so on. Uh, and I think that's gonna be your next 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 generation foods is that trying to understand all these different interactions and and what would you do to facilitate it so absolutely right okay thank you thank you Carlito. we're just in time um to introduce our distinguished keynote lecturer 
is oh i have to say if you want <laughs> this discussion is so great but i we really have to stop it and maybe someday we can have a whole day just you know keynote lectureship awardees uh, so we have to go to the next um lecture by our distinguished um uh, uh guest um and joel coelho will um introduce Eleven hours. Oh, five, six more minutes. You can dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we should probably start right on time. Yeah. Uh, yes. So about four minutes, would you say? Yes. Ten fifty-five. Ten fifty-five. Yeah. Oh, yes. four more minutes. All right. We'll, we'll wait for four minutes. Meantime, you can stare at me. Doctor <laughs> Hello, Shuji. Hello, Shuji. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank Good. you. Yes. We'll just wait about three minutes. Just start. Yeah, we'll, we'll start. Oh, I can start, start now. Yeah. Yes, All right. yes. So, greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, from the annual meeting of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. Uh, we send our greetings to all the members of the academy and we send our greetings to uh, our professional colleagues and friends uh, here in North America, in South America, in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and also Australia. You know, this week has been quite busy with the announcements of this year's crop of uh, recipients of the Nobel Prize in the various categories. And uh, the winners for the economic prize will be announced on Monday. It was not at all planned that the annual meetings uh, uh, meeting will be held during this week of the Nobel announcements. But of course, we're very pleased and we're very honored that uh, our keynote distinguished uh, lecturer today uh, is a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics. And that was uh, given to him in 2014. And that was for his invention of the high efficiency blue light emitting diodes, which was critical in terms of the, uh, the design and creation of the white uh, light emitting diodes as well, which has significant uh, benefits and applications across many industries. And the benefits of course are felt uh, around the world today. Uh, and that includes my industry, which is the indoor, the vertical farming industry, which is a fast growing industry worldwide. Mm -hmm. So today we're very pleased to have an honor to have Professor Shuchi Nakamura. Uh, he is a professor in the materials department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he's got a very luminous uh, career uh, and he's won many uh, global prizes, uh, just to name one was the 2004 uh, Millennium Technology Prize, which was given in Finland. Uh, and of course, including the Nobel Prize. Um, Shuji and I have never met. However, his invention, which is the blue light emitting diode, has been with me since the beginning of my professional career as professor at the University of Arizona uh, in 1995. That was, that was when I started. A year prior to that, I was a US National Research Council uh, postdoctoral fellow at NASA Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and I was working with uh, space farming in the Controlled Ecological Life Support Division because we were growing plants for future space missions. But even at that time, we were not working yet with LEDs. We were using high pressure sodium lamps. Now, that was because uh, Shuji came up with these high efficiency blue LEDs in 1993. And 1994, that's when it was started to be commercialized. But when I was um, offered uh, the uh, professor position at the University of Arizona, that was when uh, I was, for the first time, be able to lay hold on LEDs, including the blue LEDs as well. And that was a continuation of my NASA-sponsored projects. And since then, fast forward 26 years today, 
uh, of course, the uh, uh, vertical farming industry is now a fast growing industry globally. And it's no exaggeration to say that the blue light emitting dial, which is uh, Shuji's invention, uh, together with many other uh, Ford industrial innovations, uh, including uh, Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, automation, robotics, all of this together with the blue LEDs have really revolutionized the vertical farming industry and has dramatically transformed it into an exponential industry. So I just wanna give a shout out to the Association for Vertical Farming Industry led by Kristen Zimmerman Wassel and I serve as vice chair. And so on behalf of the industry, it is my privilege to give and express our gratitude and thanks uh, to Shuchi for your invention that has really helped catalyze the vertical farming industry globally. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you uh, <clears throat> Professor Shuchi Nakamura uh, for the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering Distinguished Keynote Lecture. We will have uh, time for a few questions after his presentation. Shuchi. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Uh... Okay. Uh, okay, you can hear me? Okay. It's okay? Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. It's okay. So, okay. Uh, so, today I talk about uh, invention of blue LED and the future solid sliding. So first, I, I talk about how I could invent blue LED, and uh, and uh, last part is just uh, I talk about application of LEDs. So first, I, I introduce myself. So this is Japan, probably you know, and uh, Japan is composed of four islands. So basically, the smallest island is called the Shikoku Island. Basically, I was born here, and uh, I studied here. I invented blue LED here, so. So this is Shikoku Island. So I was born here, Oak. Uh, it's a fishery village. And uh, uh, during elementary school, I moved to Ozu City here. I studied here up to high school. And, uh, and I went to the, uh, I joined the local university, Tokushima University here, uh, uh, because the entrance is much easier. So my grades are not so good. And uh, after graduation of Tokushima University, I joined a local company, uh, name is Nichia Chemical uh, Industry, located in Anan City. It's a local small company. Uh, num uh, number of employees are about 150 people. And uh, Nichia Chemical is at that time 100% chemical company. Uh, the the uh, product was a phosphor. Phosphor is uh, made by chemical reaction. And uh, I joined the uh, I joined the R and R and D uh, group, and uh, I worked for R and D group for twenty years, and uh, and uh, you know for twenty years, uh, you know last ten years I developed invented the blue LED, green LEDs, and the white LEDs, also blue laser dial. And the amazing story is the uh, company's founder didn't like any collaboration. So we have to develop all these semiconductor devices ourselves, independently from others. So we never collaborated universities, we never collaborated uh, companies at all. Totally independently, we developed everything uh, at a 100% chemical company. So you know, after after graduation to University of Tokushima, I joined the Nichia Chemical Industry. Uh, uh, this is me, I was young, you know. Uh, this is founder of uh, Nichia, uh, I respect him because uh, uh, for, I worked with Nichia for 20 years, always he supported me. It's, it's because, uh, you know, initially for first 10 years, you know, I worked for the infrared LEDs, but sales are very poor. So these other manager people, both are very angry to me, but, uh, but uh, always founder supported me without any interference of my research. So, you know, so that, uh, that's the reason why I could invent blue LEDs. 
So this is a uh, shows the efficiency of a red LED, green LEDs, blue LEDs as a function of the developed years. So basically, red LEDs were developed in uh, 60s, and the efficiency of red LED increased like this. But in order to make any kind of color, we need three primary color LEDs. So since the 60s, uh, many scientists all over the world tried to develop blue and green LEDs, but nobody could make it. But in 1930, uh, our local Nichia company, Nichia, suddenly announced the mass production of blue LEDs in 1930. And uh, all of people you know, all over the world, all of scientists didn't believe uh, our invention of red. So we uh, put the, our you know, demonstration of red in Osaka office and Tokyo office. And uh, many scientists came to Tokyo and Osaka office all over the world to watch our uh, demonstration of red. And then after watching our LEDs, they said, oh, oh my God, this is true, no? And also in 95, also we started the mass product, invented blue LEDs on the of green LEDs. Also, we started mass production green LEDs. So basically, in since 95, three primary color LED are available and the white LED are available. So first 10 years, after joining the nuclear chemical industry, the first 10 years, I worked for this bulk crystal growth of gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide. Also, we made the, these uh, our wafers, also epitaxial wafers for uh, infrared LEDs for first 10 years. I developed this product myself, and uh, but the sales was very poor, you know. So, you know, all of the companies, my boss, uh, complained a lot, you know. And the first 10 years, you know, but the company is a 100 was a chemical company, also no uh, research budget, almost nothing. So all of, you know, so I worked with bulk crystals, but all the reactor is homemade. This is not our reactors, but just reference now. Uh, homemade reactor. And uh, also the, we, I use the horizontal bridge methods. So quotes, you know, these quotes is, I have to, you know, uh, welding of these quotes for every day, you know, almost uh, <laughs> five hours every day so to do the, you know, horizontal bridge method uh, to make a horizontal bridge method growth of gallium mass and gold phosphide. Uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, and uh, 85, 1988, you know, I had to develop the, infrared LEDs using this uh, aluminum gallium arsenide. And uh, so this is a liquid phase epitaxial growth reactors. You can see these are homemade. This is me, <laughs> homemade. So everything, all kinds of reactor measurement equipment, everything homemade because uh, no budget. So LED, you know, so, and then, you know, I read the talk so, <clears throat> so I, okay, you know, so, so, so in my case, I, I didn't mention it. <laughs> so, so 79, I graduated University of Fukushima, you know, and the first 10 years, I mentioned, uh, I worked for Bar Crystal Growth and those one, and, uh, you know, so by spending 10 years, but sales are very poor. So, so my company has uh, both complained a lot. So, and uh, I became so un uh, angry. So, so 80, uh, 88, you know, uh, I asked the, my uh, company's founder, I saw the company founder, also president, uh, name is Asia or oh, Nobogawa. And uh, I desperately asked him, I want to develop blue LEDs because uh, I have worked for the conventional infrared and red LEDs for past 10 years and uh, no sales. And, but I could make a product, but sales are very poor. So I wanted to develop blue LEDs, you know, and. Uh, but when I asked my boss, you know, uh, always my boss, you know, uh, <laughs> say, oh, Nakamura, you are, you are joking, you know? you know, my company, my company has no background, the same kind of technology, no budget, and no scientists, only you, you know, so no way, you know, because these, during those periods, you know, you know, in Japan, for example, Panasonic, uh, Toshiba, Sanyo, and the Sony, all of uh, a big uh, company working for to develop blue LEDs and the blue LEDs there. Also, you know, in US, United States, you know, like a Hewlett, the Packard, all kinds of big company also university working for to develop blue LEDs. In that case, no budget, no scientists, no, <laughs> no background, no way. 
But uh, this part, you know, I wanted to develop blue LEDs because uh, for past 10 years, I had to develop these conventional red LEDs, red and infrared LEDs. And uh, always, uh, you know, when I read the scientific paper, biggest problem of LEDs, no blue, no green LEDs. If somebody could develop blue and green, they are huge mark. So I won't do that. So this part, uh, I will ask the uh, company founders in 88 here, 88. You know, he was a very old guy, 80 years old. You know, and I asked him, can I do blue LED, sir? He said, okay, no problem. And I, so also I never been to foreign countries. So, so, so I, I asked him, can I go abroad for one year? Yeah, he said, okay, no problem. So, so and also I, I thought that he, he was joking. So, you know, I asked his uh, budget because in the past, uh, my uh, research funding is almost nothing, you know, zero. So I asked you know, him, he said, okay, so could you give me the five million dollars for research budget for blue LED? He said, okay, no problem. So, so everything okay, you know, just a couple of minutes talking. And uh, in 88 to 89, I went to University of Florida to learn how to operate MOCBD. And uh, in 89, I came back to here now, uh, Japan, and I started blue LED research. And only spending only three years, you no. Know, you know, 99, three years, I could invent blue LEDs. Three years, very easy research because, uh, because uh, the reason is that in the past 10 years, I had to develop a conventional infrared red LEDs from the bulk crystal growth, epitaxial wafers, uh, reactors, everything homemade. So I'm the expert of LEDs, so just three years. For blue LEDs, just I change the material. Real material is the aluminum galvanic to indium galvanic and uh, and uh, and the device processing very similar. Only difference is the uh, uh, epitaxial growth. For aluminum galvanic, we use a liquid phase epitaxial growth, but uh, for blue LEDs, we use MOCVD. So that is just three years, uh, spending three years. So using just three years, yes, I uh, received the Nobel Prize now. So very easy. <laughs> so this uh, I spent the past 10 years. And uh, yeah, fasting is a tough time, you know, just. Uh, Everything homemade. Okay, so next is LED. So LED is basically composed of three layers, uh, just uh, any type layer, uh, emitting layer, and P type layer. This is any type, blue is any type layer. And uh, this is emitting layer, we call active layer, and uh, P type layer. We need three layers to make uh, LEDs. And after making these three layers, and, you know, we could invent a fast blue LEDs in 92 also. Yeah, mass production started in 93. And this is uh, blue LED structures, you know, and uh, this emitting layer is we use these materials. By changing this composition, we can make uh, uh, infrared to the red LEDs. Uh, but also uh, using uh, aluminum gallium light, we can make uh, infra, uh, uh, UV LEDs, UVC LEDs. So now using these nitride UV materials, we can make infrared emission to the uh, UVC emission uh, uh, LEDs, also laser diode. Impact. So it, probably, you know, application is uh, all kind of lighting displays and uh, because uh, energy consumption is much smaller than the uh, conventional lighting. And uh, so this is lighting. So conventional lighting is a uh, uh, light bar, light, oil lamp, long time, and incandescent bulb, plus lamp. But the efficiency is uh, only 70 or 16 lumen part. But now in the LEDs, a commercial based LEDs, almost white LEDs, almost now I think. Uh, 150, 200 lumen power. So almost three times efficient than the conventional fluorescent lamp. Uh, well, in comparison light bulb, I know, 10 times efficient. So by replacing conventional lighting, we could reduce energy consumption dramatically. So this is all data. So by 2020, how much energy is saved by replacing conventional lighting with the LEDs? So, so basically, you know, by 2020, you know, in the United States, uh, we can save the uh, energy equivalent to about 19 nuclear power plants. So, so this is a uh, you know vertical farming, uh, you know, you know vertical farming uh, using LED. Uh, we can do vertical farming. So important, we have to stack the plant growth like this to save the uh, to save the cost. So in that case, only we can use LEDs. LED cannot doesn't emit uh, infrared emission. Infrared emission 
cause the heat generation in the plant. So LED is only emitted a uh, visible light. So, you know, so that's the advantage of the you know, LEDs. And uh, so using this technology, you know, and everything uh, automation and uh, no bug, no chemical is required. So water is recycled, you know. So I think uh, about farming is a uh, future uh, agriculture. So why, you know, uh, it was difficult to develop blue LEDs? So for to make a blue LEDs, two kind of material since uh, 70s. Zinc selenide or gallium nitride based materials. So I selected gallium nitride based material. So in 70s, you know, 80s, you know, uh, there are two kinds of material I told you. zinc selenide or gallium nitride based material. You can say this is a, you know, dark line is a defect, cross section tear, defect, crystal defect. And zinc selenide, you can say nothing <laughs> in this scale. So basically, zinc selenide, no crystal defect. So, you know, in 80s, 90s, uh, 70s, there's a common sense among the scientists to make a good uh, semiconductor device, no crystal defects, no crystal, especially LEDs, number of crystal defects is less than 10 to the third. This is the order of 10 to the ninth. So 80s, no way to select zinc cyanide uh, if people have a common sense. You know, so all of the scientists basically select zinc cyanide but in the uh, all over the world, they are few group. They are crazy. They select the gallium lighter, including me. So, you know, so I think 99% say, say, uh, scientists say zinc cyanide, you know. So 89, you know, for example, 89, you know, it, 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 zinc cyanide, uh, the showing density less than 10 to the south, but the gallium lighter 10 to the ninth. Still, this uh, almost this order, you know, still no change, but uh, we can make very efficient. Uh, blue LED, green LED, white LED, everything, you know. Uh, so, for example, in 92, I attended the Japanese Society of Applied Physics Conference. At first, I went to the Garam Light Session. Garam Light Session is the uh, audience is, uh, you know, only, uh, I think, two or three, and the speaker is only two speakers, two or three speakers. So, speaker has a 15 minutes talk. So this government session is uh, over after 30 minutes, you know, certain two speakers, it's uh, 30 minutes. And next I want to the zinc sanitizers. Zinc sanitizers, the number was more than 500. And uh, I couldn't enter the room because too many people. So in my case, I went to University of Florida uh, from 80 to 89 to study the MOCB. This is the MOCBD. Uh, we constructed the MOCBD at the University of Florida with a PhD student. And uh, when uh, we consulted this P uh, MOCBD system, uh, of, uh, you know, PhD student asked me, you know, asked me, Nakamura-san, have you published any scientific paper? I said, no, I never published any scientific paper. I, my age was 30 years, 30, I think 30, 30 years old. And uh, next day they asked me, that, you have a PhD degree? No, I, I have only master's degree. Then they, you know, treat me like a te like technician. In, you know, United States, most important scientists have the PhD degree, you know. So my dream became uh, to get a PhD degree. And, uh, you know, so, so that's the reason, you know, when I, 89, I went, I, one year later, I came back to Japan. My body dream was to, to get a PhD degree uh, because I never expected I could invent blue LEDs. So when I saw the zinc cyanide or gallium nitride, I, I thought uh, it was easy to publish paper by selecting gallium nitride because gallium nitride is only, you know, every year, only few paper, one or two papers. But the zinc serenade, you know, at that time, every year, I don't know how many, a few hundred people, I don't know, but so many people. So I never published any scientific paper. So I thought easy, it was easy to publish paper by selecting gallium nitride because any result I can publish paper, no? But I never expected I could invent blue LEDs. So, so I, in 89, I came back to Japan. I started the blue LED research. So blue LED is the biggest problem. I told you we need three layer, any type of gallium nitride, emitting layer, indium gallium nitride, and P type gallium nitride. So any type of gallium nitride available, but uh, nobody could make this indium gallium nitride. Nobody could make P type of gallium nitride. You know. So, so 
So I started to grow this uh, uh, gallium nitrate based material using MOCBD. So I purchased the commercial available MOCBD system. Uh, it cost 2 million US dollars. So founder gave me 5 million US dollars so I could buy this uh, commercial available MOCBDs. So I tried to grow, uh, you know, gallium nitrate first, you know, for a couple of months, try to do that, but no crystal growth, no epitaxial growth of gallium nitrate. Then I started to modify the uh, MOCB reactor uh, by spending one and a half years. Every day, I, every morning, I modified the reactor, and every afternoon, I did the epitaxial growth run to check the growth of gallium nitrate. I continued this uh, uh, pattern every morning, modified the reactor, because for past 10 years, I told you, I, I did all, all kinds of reactors, homemade, uh, measurement equipment homemade, so I could do the change the reactor, modify the reactor. And then one and a half year, I developed this MOCBD. I named two flow MOCBD. Just the MOCBD, just one flow. I added another flow like this. I named this two flow MOCBD. And this is the biggest breakthrough in my life because uh, after this invention of two flow MOCBD, any epitaxial growth, crystal quality best in the world. Any device best in the world. You know, still Nietzsche is, uh, you know, you know, still, uh, you know, biggest company in the field of LED laser dial because they use this MOC, uh, two flow MOCBD reactor. But uh, officially, they denied that they don't use this two flow MOCBD. So, so for example, first uh, because for a pita player, I solved the pita player just using samara annealing. You know, so hydrogen participate magnesium acceptance by using samara annealing, we can remove the hydrogen. So I clarify the mechanism of the hydrogen participation of P-type layer, and uh, just uh, some annealing is the uh, best way to activate P-type layer. Also another problem, the emitting layer, indium gallium nitride. So nobody could make this materials, but uh, we could, using the uh, two-fly MOCBD, we could make very high, 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 high quality indium gallium nitride, which shows a uh, strong band-to-band -band emission at room temperature. So this is the first demonstration, demonstration of blue emission at room temperature using photoluminescence. So basically in 1992, we solved this two layers problem and just we stuck with these three layers and we could demonstrate high efficient blue LEDs in 92. And I asked the founders, why don't you do that big press list? He said, no, you have to prepare for mass production for one year by spending. So one year we secret from outside, we prepared the mass production and uh, and one year later, we did a big press of the uh, uh, high efficient blue, blue LEDs. Right, this one, first one is uh, just a conventional double hazel structure. And this one was referred to the Nobel uh, Prize Foundation press release. Also, in 95, uh, we developed the uh, first uh, uh, violet uh, laser diode, which is now used for blue ray DVD. But uh, we expect uh, blue ray DVD market to be, become larger, but uh, no, it's small. So now these uh, violet laser, blue laser now used for the uh, laser lighting, next generation laser lighting. Because the LED lighting is, uh, you know, power is small. Laser lighting is the uh, power is 100 times higher than stronger. So this laser lighting is for the automobile headlamp now. Yeah, so this one, automobile headlamp. So, uh, RUD, BMW, BMW already use a laser headlamp because the LED is a uh, power is very small, but the laser lighting is 100 times brighter. For example, this is LED headlamp is on the radiation this 300 meter. Now laser lighting is now up to one kilometer. Also laser, uh, laser, uh, you know, laser you saw the laser projector. Yeah, laser lighting is like this uh, for automobile headlamp. So small, uh, uh, point light source, and the, but the brightness one time brighter than the LED. And uh, we, so it's small spotlight, you can the MEMS, using MEMS, we can make the you know, headlamp become the projector. So we can make any image like this. It's called the dynamic lighting. And the laser diode also is a LIDAR. Uh, you know, so LIDAR is uh, uh, just a uh, you know, sensor. No? So also drone also use a lidar for you know, auto, auto driving. They use lidar so detect the as a sensor for the sound car. No? Also now we are working for the uh, micro LED display. It's called the next generation display. 
and you know, oh, oh yeah, this one is much easier. So, so right now, you know, uh, you can see the big display using LED display like this. Uh, also, a baseball stadium and the soccer stadium, like big one. But now, you know, by this uh, in this case, chip size is relatively big. Chip size is uh, like 500 and uh, one millimeter size. But making small chip size, you can make a small display like this using a blue, green, red LEDs. So this, it's called a micro LED display because this is a big advantage. Also, one micron size, you can make the AR uh, display, you know. So this is, uh, it's called a micro LED display. It's still under development, but the advantage of the, my, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, advantage of the micro LED display is this one. So right now, display is a liquid crystal display or OLED display, but the efficient, efficiency is, uh, you know, uh, well, this is micro LED is the best because much brighter. Self emission means OLED or micro LED. And the brightness is uh, much, much brighter than the conventional one. But the power size is much lower and the lifetime much better. So all category micro LED is the best spray using small, tiny uh, blue, green, red LEDs. So that's, uh, we are working for this one. And also recently we developed this is a uh, company of a Chinese company. They developed this uh, uh, micro LED display, but the but chip size is 100 micron. So it means a mini LED display, but still so beautiful, 8K. Uh, so, so I told you, so using gallium nitride uh, based material, we use aluminum nitride, aluminum nitride, and gym nitride. So using this, this material, you know, we can make a, a emitting device from wavelengths is around 200 nanometer to 1.6 micron. You know, so this is called, this is called uh, you know, UVC uh, region. So UVC the LED is now very important to, uh, you know, sterilize uh, all kinds of virus, uh, virus, you know, bacteria. You, you know, especially COVID-19 is called a big problem. So now research of UVC is very hot now. And uh, also this region is a visible uh, color, blue, green, red region is already available. So also we demonstrated the 1.16 micro quantum dot emission uh, using a room temperature here. So I think, uh, you know, this region already, you know, all the product is available. This region already product available. So next time it's the infrared region, so it's very hot, so this region. Good. So UVC LED is very hot, I told you, so it sterilizes uh, in this infect all kinds of virus and bacteria. So already visible LED is used for the uh, airplane, not like this, but the, they want to put the UVC LEDs, uh, these regions, you know, to disinfect, uh, sterilize all kinds of, uh, you know, strange uh, virus, you know. And also UVC LED is a portable consumer product, a best fit. Uh, this one is, is a water bottle, you know, already commercially available. So this one is a, in a UVC LED is here and uh, also batteries here, battery charges. You know, after battery charge, uh, it, it works almost, uh, this is 20 or uh, 30 hours. So, you know, just, uh, you know, UVC LED, you know, uh, this infects the, uh, this, uh, Dirty water. So when you go to hiking, you can put the uh, any kind of dirty water inside, and uh, this uh, you know you basically uh, this in fact sterilize uh, just the water, you know, clean the water one one minute, a couple of minutes. So you know, and also clean the all the mask and uh, you know cell phone, you know. For you know, COVID nineteen is the biggest problem. So clean the, this mask you now using UVC LEDs. So basically, use UVC disinfection. This show that uh, UVC disinfection curve. So, so disinfection high, curve means higher the better to disinfect the uh, all kinds of virus bacteria. So you can see coronavirus is this one. Coronavirus is here. So start you know, start is coronavirus here. So coronavirus, you know, to kill coronavirus, you know, around 270, 260 is the best. So. So basically, this region or 260, 280, you know, uh, to the best to to this uh, sterilize uh, all kind of virus. 
So how to, uh, you know, sterilize, uh, infect a virus is just uh, destroy the D uh, DNA like this. So I'm not sure, no, DNA not destroyed. So basically we need a uh, 260 to 90 nanometer uh, uh, UVC LEDs, but uh, this is a uh, harm for human body, uh, with, uh, but also human body, you know, skin, no? DNA is it become like this, it's destroyed. It's called the skin cancer. It's not good for human body. But now is a uh, hot one is uh, this wavelength. Uh, around 220 shorter than this one. This infection, infection curve is high, you know, this infection is very high. Also this uh, region, you know, uh, this uh, UVC, uh, five UVC, which we call five UVC. This is uh, absorbed the surface of the uh, skin. So it doesn't penetrate into the DNA. So it doesn't cause uh, skin cancer. So this is, uh, you know, People say this is a uh, doesn't cause the human uh, uh, you know any problem for human body, and also same time the you know sterilization is very strong, so this is strong. So I think uh, now we are working very hard to develop these 210 nanometer, 220 nanometer uh, UV, five UV CLD. So uh, so basically, you know, this is comparison. Currently, you know. Uh, uh, low pressure mercury lamp is for sterilization and uh, disinfection, especially in the hospital. Hospital at midnight, you know, they sterilize all kinds of virus bacteria because uh, if people are not here, people, you know, people also have skin cancer. So after midnight, but it, it's a big one, no? And this one is, is uh, very efficient, 30, 40 percent, and uh, cost is much cheaper to uh, to the power. Right now, UVC LED is uh, now we change very high now about ten percent, and uh, cost is four hundred dollar per watt. Very expensive, you no. Know? But the, for example, blue LED, blue LED is efficiency very high, like uh, now eighty percent, and the cost is uh, one dollar per watt. So cheaper than Macrium. So now you know this technology UVC LED, you know. But, in, in progress very fast. So I think uh, we can achieve the efficiency maybe in a couple of years. In that case, to become one dollar power. In that case, you know, uh, you know this uh, technology is used for all kinds to kill uh, a virus and uh, bacteria. Okay, uh, that, this is very important because, uh, because uh, you know, for example, uh, COVID-19, uh, new variant, uh, you know, coming uh, every year, a new variant. Every day, new variant coming. Every time, uh, you know, science has developed a vaccine. But uh, this UV, far UVC LED or UVC LED effective for all kinds of virus and bacteria. I'm not a medical doctor, but it looks like work for all kinds of bacteria virus. So I think uh, we can install the far UVC as a as a general lighting. Uh, we could, uh, you know sterilize all kind of virus, you know, just as a writing, using writing. Okay, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Shuji, for your inspiring, uh, for sharing with us your inspiring odyssey and uh, journey uh, toward your uh, invention of the blue light emitting diode. Uh, that was inspiring. Uh, we're going to have a few uh, questions, uh, but I will begin. I'll start. And I have a two part question uh, for you. Uh, one is lighthearted, the other one is serious. Let me start with the lighthearted one. Uh, when you received a call from Stockholm in 2014 to inform you that you received the Nobel Prize in Physics, what was your first reaction? Did you jump up and down or did you race to Disneyland uh, to celebrate? Tell us, please. 
uh, no, just uh, because already, you know, uh, before no price announcement, uh, you know, several faculty, uh, you know, probably one week before no price announcement, one week before or two weeks before, uh, several faculty got to the uh, phone call from unknown person. And uh, <laughs> the unknown person asked the, uh, please tell me the professor and I come to the cell phone number. And, uh, and the unknown person, they, they never told uh, my cell phone number, but uh, you know, the, each faculty came to me. Oh, probably this is from stock form, you know. <laughs> so you know, so you have to prepare for no prize or something like that. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so all right. So you, you were prepared with a speech. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yes. Yeah. But thank you. I'm sure that was a thrilling moment for you. So going now to the serious question, um, with respect to uh, LEDs and in terms of their electrical conversion efficiency, could you tell us what the status is? Do you think that they have reached their peak or is there still room for pushing up their electrical conversion efficiency, whether it's blue or red or green uh, yeah. LEDs? Yeah, so blue LED is, uh, you know, conversion efficiency 80%, uh, almost 80%. So room is just very small, no? I, you know. Blue LED, you know, developing a sp you know, space is very small. But the green LED is still efficiency is 40 and 50%, so a lot of room. So right now, you know, I know many scientists working for, to develop a green LED, high efficient green LED, green laser diode. Uh, blue LED, blue laser, no space. Uh, also micro LED, we need the uh, nitrate based red LEDs because uh, right now red LED is iron gap LEDs, aluminum indium gallium phosphate LEDs. But when we make a small chip size LEDs, iron gap red LEDs efficiency almost zero. Okay. <laughs> no emission. But still, nitrate based red LEDs, uh, few percent. So, so right now, you know, we are mainly working for red LED to develop red LEDs, nitrate based red LEDs. So red and green has a lot of space for, for development. Oh, that's great to know. And my last question from me, uh, talking about the laser diodes, uh, do you think that uh, that is a future candidate for lighting in vertical farms? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the power is very strong, you know, almost one at a time. Uh, higher than uh, LEDs. So uh, also, and also this is point light source, you know, uh, uh, color is white, still point light source. So you, you can use fiber. So using fiber, you know, laser lighting is spread to the, you know, everywhere. So I think uh, for vertical farming, you know, if I use the laser lighting, I think uh, I recommend the fiber. fiber fi it's a fiber itself become lighting using a laser light. It's called a fiber lighting. And uh, in that case, you know, you can say, you lay down among the plant, you know, like a fiber, you no? Know? So fiber lighting, using laser lighting, uh, we can make fiber lighting. It, it's very interesting for vertical farming. All right, thank you. Uh, can, can you see uh, on the screen the questions? Uh, Probably not, but I. This is a question oh, online. Oh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's let's do the one from Danilo Romero. So it's quite impressive work to get the Nobel Prize in such a very short time. It shows the impact of your work. As you said, the major difficulty is to synthesize uh, p-type uh, gallium nitride. Uh, this same problem in silicon initially hampered the development of CMOS technology. Why do you think? it is generally difficult to do P-type doping of semiconductors. Can you give us some materials insight on how to approach this problem? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, because uh, uh, basically, you uh, know, wide band gap material, we say wide, wide band gap material means, uh, uh, you know, accept uh, uh, level is very deep, you know, depend, you know, so it's, you know, accept, so, so it means accept level is very deep means, uh, uh, whole consensus is very small. So that's the main reason to, to make a good P-type uh, uh, layers of uh, white wine material. Garminite is one type material because of blue, you know. So that's the main reason. So all people thought it was impossible to make P-type garminite, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, I tried to the summer only after the doping of the magnesium acceptor and, uh, and then I did the summer only. <laughs> using, you know, at the high temperature. 
and then I got beta player. So even for uh, a level is very deep, but still uh, we can make the you know uh, whole constellation up to near the order of eight, ten to the eighteenth. So so but narrow wide gap is in a, a, a whole constellation is the order of ten to the nineteenth, ten to the twentieth is okay, but the still wide gap you know. Uh, whole concept is very small, 10 to the 18th, but still we can make a very good LEDs, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Julius Liano Jr., what is the trajectory of micro LED technology? What seems to be the technical hurdle or hurdles for its mass production? Oh, yeah, good question. So I told you, red LED, LED is, a, LED is the biggest problem. So big screen or red LED is made by uh, aluminum indium garden phosphide. Blue and the green is made by nitrate based material. So blue, green LED, very good. But the, for big screen, you know, aluminum indium gun phosphide LED is good. For micro LED, chip size become like a five micron, 10 micron. So if chip size less than 20 micron, you know, adding gap uh, aluminum indium gun phosphide red LED is efficiency is almost zero. For big size chip, like a, a one millimeter size, aluminum indium gallium phosphide red LED is efficiency is 40 or 50 percent, so it's okay. But chip size become uh, less than 20 micron, almost to zero. <laughs> it's you know, 0 0.001 percent, something like that. But the nitride based red LEDs, you know, chip size less than 10 micron, still efficiency is two or three percent. But the two or three percent still not enough. So we are developing high efficiency night LEDs, more than efficiency, more than 10 or 20%. So red is the biggest issue right now, micro LED. Yeah. Blue Thank and you. green, night red is a bit, no problem. But the red is the biggest problem right now. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Danilo Romero, is the band gap of the indium gallium nitride emitting layer adjustable to achieve the color that you want? Uh, to produce the white light, for instance, do you have different uh, in composition, indium composition to produce uh, RGB colors? Yes, yes, uh, yes, it, it's possible, but the problem is the cost. You know, for example, uh, white, white LED, white LED, who make a white LEDs, you know, using a white LED, the best white LED is sunlight. Sunlight is a full spectrum, full spectrum, no? So in order to make a full spectrum, blue, green, red is not enough. We need a uh, yellow or uh, you know, all of violet. You know? so in, that case, to advincula, advincula. in that case, cost become huge. So easiest is just the blue and the phosphor. Phosphor is just, you know, phosphor emit the all kinds of color. It, it easily become full spectrum. So blue LED, the coating of phosphor, phosphor, phosphor is the powder. So that's uh, in the view of the cost much cheapest technology. So that is mainly uh, white LED is uh, made by a blue LED and plus phosphor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to jump to uh, the question by Rigoberto Advincola. There is a lot of use of lasers and guided light for photopolymerization and centering in 3D printing. Uh, could you give a comment to enable higher pixelization or voxelization? in stereo lithography or more powerful laser for centering of polymers. Uh, thank you, and very inspiring. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, depending on the wavelength power, no? So, so now we are developing now, I told you, UVA, BC, LED, laser dials. Now we are getting very high. Listen to the, uh, some group now make uh, the UVC laser at the wavelength 270 nanometer. Uh, those ones, uh, you know, but still takes time, but uh, in the future coming. So still, uh, you know, uh, shorter wavelengths and uh, high power UV and laser is uh, under development. It, it's uh, coming in the near future. So so you can use those ones. Yeah. All right. And, and last question. Uh, oh, uh, let's see. Yes, uh, three pos for LEDs has for some time been pumped with blue LED. Uh, purple LEDs have come to the fore. Has it taken up some share from blue LED? Purple LED, has, it, has purple LEDs uh, taken up some share from blue LEDs? See, as purple LEDs, some shares of blue LED. Uh, I, I cannot understand the meaning. 
I guess it's uh, is a purple LED a competitor to blue LEDs? Oh, purple. Oh, yeah, to make white. I think to make white. You know? So yeah, purple. We say purple or violet. You know. So uh, that time is a uh, purple and the violet is 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 uh, best to make white LEDs because uh, available phosphor to make. So I told you, so best of white lighting is a sunlight. Sunlight is the most friendly lighting, light for human body, you know? So using a white LED, we have to imitate the sunlight. So in that case, you know, using a violet LED plus phosphor is the best because the available phosphor, number of available phosphor is more than the, you know, blue LED plus phosphor because, the, you know, exciting energy is much higher by violet LED. But the blue is the excitation is small, so uh, not available for is much smaller. So I think uh, using a violet LED or purple LEDs, it's easy to to imitate the sunlight using phosphor. So you know, so that's the reason you know, of violet or purple LEDs are best to make white LEDs. Uh, thank you, Shuchi. Uh, I'll ask the final question because I know you have to catch a flight later in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I really appreciated your sharing your experience as a grad student, a PhD student. Uh, what, what advice would you give uh, current uh, PhD students in science and engineering so that uh, they would uh, be more successful in, and, and inspired in their research? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, most important of the, you know, science is the creativity, creativity, you know. Uh, you know at the UCSO, I, you know, found it a lot of great students, very smart students. Uh, they read uh, all kinds of scientific papers, a lot of knowledge, and uh, they try to, for example, I ask the uh, device, you know. After reading the paper, you know, they try to, you know, copy the technology, you know, if paper like this, they try the same thing. It's, you know, and they, they can make a good device, same as uh, which is written in the paper. Uh, it's not good. Most important, the creativity, so, you know, students have tried a totally different what they written in paper, you know? So most important, the creativity, not reading the scientific paper, you know? so, so. Some of the smarter students are totally forgotten those things. Most important the creativity. I mean that you have to challenge to that. You have to take a risk. You have to challenge that what nobody has done, what no how nobody has done. No, that's the most important for creativity in our science community. You know. That is a very important advice, and I completely uh, agree with you 100%. But last question as a follow-up. Do you, how do you think uh, that get cultivated in you, your creativity? Yeah, yeah, always. So, so still, you know, I, I learned this creativity, you know, for, you know, my, my, for past, you know, in, after joining Nietzsche for past 10 years, I developed a, you know, battle crystals and, uh, uh, red and the infrared. At that time, I I had to read all kind of scientific paper and uh, patent, and uh, I intentionally copied the technology. So that that is and product sales very poor. So after that, you know, for when try to brew LED research, I never, you know, I no not there, but almost I never read any scientific papers patent at all. Just I, I experiment. I did the experiment and the experiment I, I saw the experiment, how to improve this result, how to improve this result. Just my idea, that only my, I didn't read any. So it was easy. I don't, don't have to any papers at all, just the concept of research. Uh, at getting a result, I have to think about the result myself. Always, don't read any paper. It's noise, become noise. <laughs> that's the you know? that's the reason. You know? I couldn't invent the you know noble reactor, and I could develop, I invent a pita layer and activate everything. So using my own one, that is a creativity. You know? So all of the students do the same thing. Just you know, for basic, basic study, at, at, you know, you have to read the papers and read the text. But at a certain point, just to concentrate research is that you are that. <laughs>
<laughs> so, Shuji, thank you so much. Yes, I, I guess part of it is one uh, has to be willing to be unorthodox. <laughs> but thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're honored by your uh, speaking with us today. Um, and let's give him, please, a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And Shuji, and we hope to uh, keep in touch with you. So this is the uh, the end of the session for this. No, 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 no. no. March. Oh, March, please. Yes. Five minutes. Yes. Oh. Thank you all. Thank you. I guess I'm saying this is the end of the session for those who are uh, watching the uh, the live stream. Thank you. No, let's do it. No, no, let's just do it now. Lunch, Nana. Because I don't want to do it. Do it. Okay. 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 um can you oh, okay oh repeat it oh okay uh so we will have a five minute break and then we have another plenary talk before i guess before you go to sleep and before we go to lunch and the fellows are just and one minute. also we have one minute to introduce our fellows i know we had a session for them but alvin is alvin doing it no uh, oh, oh, i doing... guess mario is going to do the introduction of the fellows Okay, so a few more minutes.
Uh, before we start with the uh, last plenary session for uh, uh, this morning, to run through uh, uh, noon time, I just would like to read the names of the uh, APAMs that United in the Philippines. But uh, they're supposed to be introduced earlier, but we will show the pictures later uh, tonight. Uh, Miss Sharin Antoinette Antonio, Jupiter Cartel. Yokimiko David, Marvin J. Henogin, Jeremy J. Magdaong, George Ringo Manapat, Cheryl May Mariano, Andres Philip Mayol, Senior Rino Montales, Patrick Vinci Reyes, Amy Saladaga, Amiel Valderrama, Carlo Lorenzo Benoya. Uh, we also have uh, Cynthia Garcia Idol, and we have Jan Eustachio, and we have, of course, Noel Ipora. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, we'll see you again tonight. Okay, so we have had so much excitement. Uh -oh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay, and so we have one more exciting plenary talk for today. And so I'm pleased to introduce to you our next speaker who came all the way from the Philippines, Dr. Rosalie Arcala Hall. She is a full professor and scientist at the University of the Philippines Visayas in Niago, Iloilo. And we were just talking about the nuances of Iloilo language this morning. Um, she completed her master's degree in political science and PhD in international and public affairs at Northeastern University, Boston, Massachusetts on a Fulbright Case Scholarship in 1998. She was involved in research projects on disaster management and water governance with grants from UP Visayas and UP System Emerging Interdisciplinary Research, IEPR. She's principal investigator of a multi-year CHED GIA project on domestic water use and access in the Visayas. She's co-author of related articles in Philippine Political Science Journal, Water Policy, International Journal of Water Resources and Development, Water International and Philippine Journal of Science. Her latest publication is a co-authored article with June, Chris, Espia, and Vinagera on local pandemic response in contemporary Southeast Asia. And she's a member of the Philippine Commission on Higher Education Technical Committee and Political Science, and was president of the Political Science Association. So, without further ado, please welcome uh, Dr. Rosalie Arcala Paul. March. Hello, thank you very much, March, for that kind introduction. I will try to be very brief because it's a difficult <laughs> thing to be caught between you and your lunch. I <laughs> have the sleeping time of our colleagues back in the Philippines. So as mentioned, I'm one of only two persons who managed to make the crossing, and I'm very, very happy to uh, be able to join you uh, for this Paase uh, Apams. Uh, only my third. I had been invited uh, to join uh, by... Uh, uh, the current president of PAASE, Dr. Gisela Concepcion, who was uh, our uh, former uh, vice president for academic affairs at UP. And uh, we're one of the few uh, social scientists in PAASE, uh, largely recruited through her efforts. Uh, by the way, what I will be sharing with you right now will be presented again by uh, June Chris Espia, my colleague for the PAASE REC 13 panel. Uh, our time slot is on Monday. Uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. is Philippine time, uh, October 11. So we have a full panel for Paasirek 13. I'm a co-chair of that particular panel along with Dr. Sara uh, Dukanes from uh, the School of Echo. Okay, so recentralization and pushback. As a political scientist, I've always been interested in uh, how power is, um, is utilized and, and dispensed by uh, institutions, uh, particularly of government. And in the case of the COVID-19 response, the pandemic response, we're very interested in the way that the national government uh, related to local governments generally, because a lot of the COVID-19 responses are for the most part implemented at local governments, and they varied quite widely. Uh, Iloilo City is uh, uh, what the area that where the city where I live, 
and uh, actually a, a close partner of U UP in the Visayas. We are based in Yagao, Iloilo, but we also have a campus in Iloilo City and our university has a very long, a very good productive policy relationship uh, with the city government of Iloilo. Next slide. So uh, one could recall three things about very important about the Philippine COVID-19 response. We were under a state of emergency. We did not have that in the United States. What it means is that in the Philippines, the president was given extraordinary powers to do whatever was necessary to address the pandemic. It was uh, an emergency power that was granted to him by the Philippine Congress and renewed twice. We call that Republic Act Bayanihan. Uh, so twice the president was given emergency powers. And what it also means is that it's an, an abnormal circumstance. It's a regime of exception because the president all the more is empowered to take measures and local governments are in no position to say no. And this is the whole story behind the COVID-19 response that I think many people forget. We were in a state of emergency. And so for that period, for a lot of things that the national government carried out, uh, that the local governments had really no choice uh, but to implement uh, even under duress. Uh, okay, so what I want to do now is to take the case of Iloilo and to describe national local that government dynamics with the city of Iloilo. Uh, why the city of Iloilo? This presentation is actually one half of the article we did for this contemporary Southeast Asia, all about urban politics comparing us from Cebu. And the reason why these two uh, cities were compared is because Cebu has a mayor who is perfectly aligned with the Duterte administration, a mayor that had seated the Osmeñas, long political dynasty in Cebu, and uh, to which uh, the national government took really harsh measures. It was only in Cebu, outside of Manila, that the national government decided to deploy both the police and the armed forces for the implementation of their month-long lockdown. We did not have that anywhere else in the Philippines and certainly not in Iloilo. So uh, we wanted to kind of illustrate this sort of dynamics just to key in on the sort of resistance, uh, the pushbacks that are happening even under these circumstances to also map the city government's own efforts in linking up with the private sector and with the academy in particular, uh, our university certainly had a lot of linkages with the city government, starting with the Genome Center, the, the Philippine Genome Center, the besides is based at our university, and we helped in, uh, in setting up the, the early RT-PCR labs uh, for the, the testing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the central government, the dynamics is very much governed by this fact that our mayor is not aligned with Malacanang, has been tagged early on. Uh, because uh, our city in the war on drugs, we have been uh, identified as the most, what was the Shabulai city? It means that we, we have been identified as having a mayor, but then gone missing because he was some sort of a target. And for, for the sake of his life, you know, he had gone missing and went a wall. We don't know what happened to him uh, because he was on the drug list. So it was not a very pleasant thing uh, to be mayor of Iloilo under this administration. Uh, that, that, that certainly is the case. So next slide. Uh, well, the, the Iloilo is interesting because we also had surge of cases uh, in, in the year that was, and, and that's generally the, the spike you see there uh, happened uh, in uh, right about August to December. And uh, we'd seen a surge again with the Delta cases in June. So we've only uh, done uh, a kind of lockdowns, strict lockdowns generally in two episodes. Uh, one in, uh, in, in March, April, and May, ended in May. And then again, uh, this particular June uh, lasted for about six weeks uh, because of the, the surge. But this alphabet soup is an eye, you know, tracking down, okay, what's the current quarantine classification for the Philippines? Uh, and particularly for your city, it's important because it will determine whether you can go out, can you go to the market, can you take public transportation, can you report to the office? All of those depend on your quarantine classification. And the, the, the red highlights basically are the most severe. So several times in the past year and a half, we've been subjected to very strict lockdowns, moderate lockdowns, which had very serious implications on our ability to move around. 
Okay, next slide. Uh, what we wanted to do is to kind of analyze this dynamics from the perspective of network governance. So we know for a fact that it's a highly centralized system. The national government calls out a lot of things that local governments have to do. But there's also room for maneuver on the part of local governments. So we're interested in the node at the national level, that's the interagency task force or Malacanang, and its relations to the local governments, particularly the mayor, who actually is, is empowered under the local government code to replicate whatever sort of directives there are at the national level. But we admittedly, it's a highly centralized, and all the more so because it's in a state of emergency. All local government units, if they disobey any of the IATF guidelines, they are facing what they call a show cost order. They will be brought to court. And then oh, many times the national government has threatened to sue uh, local governments precisely because they don't, they, they disobey, they, they plan to disobey certain directives coming from the national government. Next slide. So uh, Iluino is very small. Uh, my, my husband says it's the Goldilocks of the Philippines. Uh, only about 500,000, a very small compared to Mega Manila or Cebu. But again, uh, what's important about us is we are a hub of Western Visayas. We are the center of Western Visayas region, and this comprises the entire island of Panay and Negros Occidental. So it's very important in terms of the econ economy of the region. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's our mayor. Our mayor has been very controversial over this uh, whole uh, COVID uh, episode. Why? Because he's the only mayor who dare come, uh, who dare cross Duterte and, and his minions. So talagang, uh, he, he doesn't mean words. And he had very, very public tirades with the, with the national government over things like quarantine classification. Can you do testing? Can you effect a travel ban? Can you do a border control? He's very opinionated and makes it public. And therefore, he's one of the few mayors who is able to do just that. So on these six areas, we kind of analyze the dynamics because it is in these six areas uh, in the pandemic response that we found that there's a lot of the pushback going on. So contact tracing and testing, community quarantine classification, the distribution of the AYUDA, the, the social amelioration program, which they did twice, the repatriation of overseas Filipino workers. This was really messy. If you can imagine, millions of people went back to the Philippines, overseas foreign workers, and then alongside locally stranded individuals. If you were stuck in Manila sometime in March, it will take you forever to get back to wherever it is your home place because there's no plane, there's no boat, unless the government you know, comes up with a, with a repatriation scheme. And then, of course, over time, as the pandemic wore on, it became very evident that lockdowns is not the way to go because it was really, uh, really, really uh, causing very deleterious effect on the local economy. All of these decisions have to be made by the local government, whether to reopen or not. Next slide. So, uh, again, the testing. At this point, there was no money from the government. So, lahat sarili sika. You really have to do it yourself. And for the government, it, uh, the local government, it meant the first time around testing. How do you go about with the testing? So uh, uh, the four facilities for testing were set up with the UP, uh, that's the UP Besides Stone Center, uh, two other private hospitals. So what they did was they, they, they sent people to train in Manila, and then they went back to you to, uh, to, to Iluino and set up laboratories very quickly, if you think about it. So uh, four, that's not bad at all. Considering the fact that in the early part of the pandemic, all of the tests had to be sent to the Tropical Medicine Institute in Manila, it took forever. Okay, so, but on top of the test that was required by the AATF, they also requested mandatory tests for recoveries. So, all of these are paid for by the local government. So, uh, apart from the RT PCR test, all of the incoming passengers to Iloilo were required to do uh, coordination and acceptance. As requirement. So if you are a uh, locally stranded individual returning to Iloilo or uh, OFW, apart from the RT PCR test, you have to also do some sort of additional test. It's, it's very difficult. Next, next, uh, community quarantine. So again, the IATF come every two weeks, the IATF says, oh, okay, Iloilo, you fall under whatever modified enhanced community quarantine. And then LGUs are expected to comply. So in the first place, the Iloilo City tried very hard to harmonize whatever it is that you are the ATF classification, then that's it. We'll live with it for the next two weeks. But there had been 
eight times that the Illinois City Mayor said, no, we don't accept that IATF classification. You can appeal. They are the, we are the only ones who have done that much appeal. Other NGOs, they never appeal at all. So eight times between March and April 2021, they appeal. It's like we want lower it down or increase it, whatever. Uh, and they also implemented surgical lockdowns way ahead of the national standards. So again, the very public spots, all of these uh, the appeals for reclassification came with very public spots uh, between our city mayor and the BILD chief. Next slide. So there have been a lot of things that they have done. On top of the money we received from the national government, the local government received, they were all, uh, they were topped up by money that was generated or, or, or uh, sourced out by the local government. Uh, again, a lot of Sabiri Sika because it's never enough. Uh, but a whole lot of them went to procurement of, uh, of uh, personal protective equipment, uh, setting up the laboratory, and then building the what they call a quarantine facility. So if you come into Iloilo, immediately, you know, from the airport, you are taken into a quarantine facility and you have to stay there for anywhere from a week to 14 days, depending on the quarantine classification. So next slide. Um, so the, the local government had a lot of needs, but they're short of money. But they managed somehow to top up whatever they received uh, in terms of uh, the, the millions that, that came down from the national government's uh, social evaluation program. And they even even were able to uh, assist low-income households with a lot of these food packages. Uh, they established soup kitchens throughout the city for the frontline workers, uh, PPEs, tax deferment for businesses, as well as assistance to ambulance vendors. And they developed their own team that runs the, 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 the it, there's a, actually we, we keep updated about uh, local government issuances and COVID-19 trends through a, uh, a program and an app that they are widely, widely distributed. So that's how we know about what's happening in our city. Next. Uh, okay, so these are the five episodes where samples where they contested the repatriation. So when there was a surge in Cebu, our government said, no, we're not accepting people from Cebu. They're banned from it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very difficult in the Philippines because then you'll have to decide, do you close your border? Do you not close your border? Do you accept people from Cebu? Do you not accept people from Cebu? It's, it's very, very complicated. And so to this day, to this day, you cannot really fly from one place in the Philippines to the other because it all depends on the LGU whether or not to accept you in terms of the inbound travel. Next slide. Uh, border control, again, uh, it may, I don't know if, if, if you've seen pictures of border control. I mean, we're not, it's not as bad as Manila when they had the military and the army deployed where they actually had checkpoints and they're, they're checking credentials before you can go in and out of the city. Uh, it's not that as bad in Iloilo, you know, they were not as meticulous. But nevertheless, they had been uh, the land borders where they had checkpoints run by the PNP, the army, and so on. Uh, Iloilo City had resisted closing the borders because the economic lifeline of the city depends on workers that are coming from Guimaras Island and in other suburbs of Iloilo and closing the border seems of course very irrational. So they persisted against it. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, again, a surgical lockdown. So even before it became national standard, the, the city already said, if we have the epidemiological data that says that there's a cluster of infection here in this barangay, whatever, you just close that barangay, but everyone else is open. And that's exactly the kind of formula that they have adopted since October last year. They call it surgical lockdown, ward-based lockdowns, uh, depending on clusters of infection, because that data is actually available. So uh, 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 vaccines. So as you will know, Nikki Asia recently published the listing of uh, vaccine developed uh, vaccine distribution, and the Philippines is dead last. Uh, sad, dead last. Uh, but uh, that means that the the, the vaccination uh, rollout is not as going as fast as we could possibly could. Nationally speaking, it's only about twenty percent. So, but in Iloilo, uh, we are the one of the first LGUs to actually procure. Uh, there's some issue over, over vaccine procurement because the national government was saying, hey, hang on, 
who buys the vaccines, the national government or the local government. The local government said, if you have the money, then we should just buy ourselves. But the national government said, no, it's not your money. It's money from DBF. So you need to get cleared from us uh, uh, if you want to buy vaccines. So a lot of the local governments procured their own vaccines. So if you are, are tracking the vaccine procurement in the Philippines, so it's not always the national government that procures all the vaccines. Local governments can do that too. And our local government in Iloilo set aside a lot of money uh, for vaccine procurement. But again, it's slow in coming. Uh, all these donations coming from the U.S. government, we don't know if some of it eventually will come to Iloilo. We never know. That's not part of the dynamics of the national law, but people are always complaining. Our city government complained because most of the, the, the COVAX facility vaccines as well as those donations coming from the U.S., they go to Manila, they go to Davao, they go to Cebu, but never to other cities. Is it surprising at all? No, under this administration. So again, um, you, try, you try your best because there are just things that you cannot control. Uh, and and the, uh, apart from the vaccine uh, procurement, there's also that mega facility that they had to kind of think about, okay, where can I gather a lot of people so I can inject as many in one safe sitting, whatever. So they, they, they have mega facility of uh, vaccination sites, such as just the Illegal Convention Centers and five other sites, including University of the Philippines. We are a vaccination site. So uh, we, we, the, many of the universities in the city opened up their campuses to get uh, as, as sites for vaccination. Uh, next, I think I'm down to last one. So I think the lesson that can be drawn from the case of LGU is that in the, in the absence of these links with the national government that would otherwise enable you to access these resources. In Ilongo, we have a saying in politics called malapit sa luwag you're close to the door. Well, definitely in Milo, it's not close to the door. So you have to make a lot of discarte. So uh, a relatively harmonious relationship, but Milo goes for it is that he has good relationships with all the neighboring LGUs. The province of El the province of Gimaras, the Gimar Gimaras, Ilo Ilo province, uh, and the, all the other outlying provinces have good relationship, which is Good, because if you so decide to close your border, you know, it's not just your decision, but decisions of the other outlying LGUs as well. So aid uh, has been distributed. There's that uh, known district representative who tried to also distribute aid at her own effort. Uh, and, and there's some competition on that, but uh, largely a lot of the top up on the assistance that were extended to population came from civil society and the private sector. It's amazing to us just uh, how much social capital uh, Mayor Trenas has because he's able to draw in from the civil society and property sector within and outside the city to get donations for all the uh, relief operations, the community kitchens, the, the quarantine and the testing efforts. A lot of them are, are pitch-ins coming from various uh, sectors uh, in the city and outside uh, because, again, you have to rely on your own resources. Next. Uh, okay, so these are the take takeaway. So I think the lesson from the COVID is that because it's a state of emergency, national government is more than just a gatekeeper. They're not just a gatekeeper. They have a lot of leverage and, and the muscle uh, with respect to LGUs because if you defy an LG, uh, a national IAP of orders, you are facing a show cause order. Uh, you are you are be facing a lawsuit, and this is something that many LGUs try to avoid. But that said, uh, the Iloilo City's uh, relationship with Malacanang has always been tumultuous at the beginning. But uh, in the scheme of things, in the COVID response, that relationship between the city government and the national government is but a small node. If we do network governance, we expect that the node is going to be big. Well, if you're Cebu, it might be great. Or if you're Davao, it might be great. But in the case of Iloilo, it is not. And it's not surprising again because we have a mayor who is unaligned. And of course, uh, the shifting terrain of national local relations moving forward, I think uh, after the pandemic and with the elections coming, it will be very interesting uh, to see whether uh, the, the, the Iloilo politics would be affected at all by these national local dynamics. We suspect not. We suspect not. 
So whoever runs for president will not be affected by the outcome of the efforts at the local government level. Uh, and such will be the case uh, for, for uh, I, I suspect that that's going to be uh, so uh, for the next elections. So just as a, a plugging, uh, this particular expanded version is going to come uh, as part of a book that is now under review with Ateneo Press. Uh, and <laughs> the book that uh, we titled it Lockdowns and Lowdowns. Okay, so, um, so it's all about COVID-19 response mapping all of this in various local governments in Italy, you know, because we strongly felt that there is a need to tell the story uh, of how the response happened at the local level. Because at the end of the day, it, that is what matters to most people. It is not really that much what is ordered at Metro Manila. Thank you so much. So that's a very fascinating talk. Uh, we have time for a few few questions. Yes. Yeah. Do, should I use the speaker? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, roughly, for for I'm going to be the person saying, I love you talk. Uh, I think as a Filipino American living in the States, I really do struggle with knowing what's happening on the ground versus what um, media outlets would tell otherwise. Um, and I've been, you know, following social media about what's happening on the ground. Um, I'm interested in, because there's a lot of community-based solutions, like community bridges that tries to serve materially the needs of lower income, um, basically communities. and. If I remember correctly, those community bridge distribution efforts got broken up at best and red tagged at worst. Yeah. So what what do you recommend to um, I guess for local communities and allies, be it abroad or you know in the Philippines, um, to um, meet meet the material needs of the people while still avoiding militaristic responses? Yeah, yeah. That's very yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. So sometime uh, late last year, a community pantries, I think we call it community yeah. pantries, started showing up initially by uh, a person who's very concerned about her barangay in Manila. And she, she just one day showed up, decided she's going to gather a whole bunch of food and put it in front of her door. And then people just come and take whatever they wanted. And this inspired a lot of communities to do the same thing. So they sprouted all over the place, including in our city. Uh, UP actually, we had we ran a community pantry for I think three or four bouts. Uh, so uh, we opened, uh, we have a uh, city campus borders Ibiernas, Barangay Ibiernas. Uh, and so it's a, a very low income community. Uh, and so we opened, uh, we had a community pantry that ran for, if I'm not mistaken, three times. So again, the donations were coming from faculty and uh, faculty and, and staff of UP. I uh, give money or food, and then everything is brought together. And then we just open the gates, and everybody just people from the community just lines up and get whatever they want. So the sad thing about these all community efforts is that they've been red tagged. Uh, in uh, I believe November 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, our government decided to quietly slip in the anti-terror act this is the infamous anti-terror act which enabled our uh, uh, police therefore to kind of uh, uh, tag uh, or that and identify a whole lot of individuals and activities under the ambit of terrorism very ambiguous and of course highly controversial so some of the community pantries have been uh, dissuaded as a result because they got scared. You know, it's tough if you if, if, a, if a member of the police suddenly comes to you and says and starts asking questions. It's a scary prospect. So uh, it's uh, so some of the community pantries endeavors were 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 red tagged as it were red to mean communist uh, because the communist uh, insurgents have been. Uh, labeled as a terror group in the Philippines following the anti-terror act of uh, uh, 2020. So uh, a, a lot of the, the communist, uh, the, the community pantry efforts therefore were um, kind of uh, dampened uh, because of the fear that they're going to be led that. So uh, there has always been, uh, it's, it's been widely said, and I think I agree to that, that the response to the COVID-19 in the Philippines, particularly in the early part, was heavily militarized. So again, you know, why do you need to deploy the military and the police? It's sort of counterintuitive, right? Parang, anong nangyari? Bakit kailangan mo mag-deploy? It's again, it, 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 to me, 
I understand that we are in a state of emergency that the president can do whatever is necessary and he is in fact legally empowered by our Congress to do so. But it seemed counterintuitive to me that you would decide to deploy your military and police for law enforcement, for basically law enforcement. And then they even started arresting people who violated curfews. Uh, and uh, there was a point when the business community actually came out with a, uh, with, a, with a very stern public announcement questioning the government's legality of arresting people for violating curfews. That's a violation of civil rights. So uh, again, uh, and then after that, the, the government said, okay, we won't arrest people anymore. And then they said, oh no, we're not arresting them. We're just kind of putting them in this stadium where they are to be lectured about the evils of COVID-19 and spreading how you need to stay home, etc., etc. But no, you're putting them in, in crowded spaces and you lecture on them for two hours, which increases the rate of infection. Nobody even thought about that. But, <laughs> yeah, but it, it's a long process again of kind of like trying to, the government does something and then people react and say, that's really not a good thing to do. Uh, but I think that moving forward, I think the Philippines, we really reflect on the fact that it was a militarized response and it was not effective. So at the end of the day, the lockdowns did very little in terms of arresting the infection rates uh, or preventing this, the Delta surge for that matter. It still happened. So which brings us again to the kind of uh, a, 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 a reflection of did it do more damage and harm? I think a lot of damage had been done in terms of the uh, the fear and anxiety of people in Metro Manila and Cebu. Never has Metro Manila and Cebu seen that many uniformed officers in the street, fully armed. Uh, in, in Cebu, it was even worse because they had APCs, that's armored personnel carriers, stationed in between the streets in, in areas that were under quarantine. It, it was a, a scary thing for, for many people to be under that situation for six weeks. So yes, thank you so much. And we really hope that the next government would be more circumspect in thinking about what better ways to, to control the pandemic rather than just kind of knee-jerk reaction of deploying the military because it's a convenient thing to do. Uh, Sadiq? Yes, I have to go right yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you ask a question, come line up. <laughs> I truly admire your efforts. And uh, if we multiply, we've flown through a billion times, there's a lot of hope for the Philippines. Um, <laughs> my questions are more practical. Uh, what is the infection rate in Iloilo, the death rate, and the vaccination rate, and what kind of vaccines have you received? Okay. Thank you. Yes. The national rate uh, during the Delta surge, it it really peaked at about 20,000. And then right now we're down to 9,000. Thank God, you know, it finally went down. For a while there, they were doing uh, daily averages. Uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in Iloilo, the reason why we had been under uh, enhanced community quarantines in, in June and then modified enhanced community quarantines because we have one of the highest uh, in infection rates. I think we were uh, over 5,000 a day. So it, it was, uh, uh, but in the Philippines, uh, I get a disclaimer again, because they, we are not testing as many. Uh, you have to understand that the tests are not widely done. Uh, so even the numbers are very deceiving. There, it could be a much higher number if tests, tests are regularly done. Why are tests not being done? Because they're expensive. Uh, so, and, and the government says the only test that they recognize is the RT-PCR test. And in the Philippines, an RT-PCR test costs, the last time I took it before coming to the United States, because I cannot board an American flight unless I take an RT-PCR test and it has to be a negative a result, it was 4,000 pesos. That's 80 US dollars. So as you can imagine, even... Unless you really kind of like really sick and you know showing severe symptoms for which you do need to be tested, so then you can be brought to the hospital, people will not get tested. 
So it's not something that, that European will do, unlike in the United States. So the numbers, I think, are very low. I think we could be higher, but just because the, the tests are not done as widely. So even so, the national government says that if you reach a certain level of positivity rate on a daily basis, if your daily average surpasses this, you will be put on NECQ. And then I remember one of the spots between our city government and the national IATF regarding the, the, the classification of Iloilo has something to do with the test. So if you think about it, uh, what Iloilo test is 1,500. So halimbawa, the 5,000 ang, ang daily average mo. Sino sino ba yung nagpa-test? Where do they actually come from? All of the regional hospitals in Panay are in Iloilo City. So if people are going to get sick, they're all going to be admitted in Iloilo City where the hospital facilities are. And therefore, if they tested positive, the number, where, where does the number go? Where does it get encoded? Iloilo City. So this is the reason why our city government went back to the DILG and said, you're counting it all wrong. These are not our people. <laughs> These are not our people. These are people from Antique. These are people from Rojas. They just come here because they, the hospital is, is, is in our city. This is outrageous. So I, the, this conversation went on and on and on because, again, this highly problematic aspect in the Philippines is how do you count? How much is counted? Etc. Because all of that is negotiable. Okay, so, so something again that, that, that is not really very uniformly uh, implemented as it were. But that, that's, that's to answer your question. So MECQ and then vaccination rates. Again, the national average right now is 20%. Okay. I just heard the, 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 the interview of the, of the health secretary and then said, oh, no, no, we're doing great because our target was 70% of the target population and now we're close to 30% of the 70%. <laughs> I was like, what, what does that mean? 30% of 70%? And it just, it, 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 it's just very frustrating. Oh, it doesn't look good. But as it were, all your vaccination depends on the vaccines you receive. So what we follow in Iloilo City is the shipment how many arise because that all depends you can eject all of that no problem we have the vax, the, the facility we have the site the problem is how many of these vaccines do you actually get so i won't be surprised if our vaccination rate in Iloilo is lower than the 20% total because we are not getting the vaccines that we want so i, I coming to the united states i am very kind of like uh Kind of frustrated because in the Philippines people want to be vaccinated but they don't have the vaccine. In the US, there's yeah. so much more vaccine, but people don't want to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, if there is just a way, you know, if you don't want it, just ship it to us, we'll take it, whatever. But it's uh it's it's, it's really very frustrating to, to think about the, the, those things, you know. And you're supposed to get two shots, but in between two shots, that will again depend on the availability of the of the shipment. Mm. So uh, the, the last uh, my my UP, uh, I think uh, Dr. Bobaha last night says I asked him, you know, are you vaccinated yet? What kind of vaccine did you get? And uh, in the in the Iloilo, uh, we get a variety. So Sinovac, AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer. But the Pfizer one is very, very uh, hard to come by uh, because the Philippines, the Pfizer and Moderna ones are either donated by the United States or uh, they are procured uh, by the city government and national government. So the Pfizer Moderna is procured, that is bought. Uh, the Sinovac is donated by China. Uh, and uh, there's also Johnson & Johnson, which I think is procured. AstraZeneca, the most part, is a COVAX facility. So, but again, uh, it varies from city to city. People in Manila are, are very lucky because I think there's so much more vaccines in Manila than there are outside of Manila. Uh, but again, 
how do you uh, yes well, i heard that mom oh yes in java they have a lot of vaccines not so in the uh, so <laughs> the, the question oh, then again is that uh the, the question then again is if you get back if you get the vaccine um how do you get it because uh, you know, in, in the United States, you just kind of like go to your pharmacy, in CVS, yes. get yourself jabbed or whatever. You don't have to pay, you know, you just have to like kind of accomplish things online. Then you set a schedule, you go there, get a job done. In the Philippines, that's not the case. You have to be on a list. How you get in a list is a very <laughs> interesting thing. Okay, so just to give you an idea, uh, UP, University of the Philippines, tried Right to say, it's like, okay, we're going to do one procurement for all of UP system. Didn't happen. In the end, our, uh, our each of the, the, the UP presidents said, okay, you UP, just go contact your LGU and figure out a way to inoculate your faculty and staff. We haven't inoculated our students yet because they haven't shown up since March 2020. So our university is closed. We don't have face-to-face -face sessions. So in the end, everyone to its own. You just have to go ask your LGU your local government, please get me on the list and they will tell you if it's your turn to get on the list. Again, it's it's a highly inefficient, I understand, but a whole lot of uh, difficulty arises from the fact that uh, we just don't have enough of the vaccine. Yeah. Thank I would suggest that we will continue more of the discussion as we eat, so I'm sure we have good appetite and good discussions. <laughs>